What's going on, guys? Welcome to Magic After Dark. My name is Ryan Edwards. This is my co-host. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Blaze Sarah. Welcome everybody to the show. We are so excited for tonight's guest. Super this pumped. Is, uh, this is going to be insane tonight. Uh, we are we are all very lucky tonight to have this guy. So yes, very lucky. Uh, I'm excited to pick his brain. We have an absolute legend in the magic world as well as in the acting world. Let's bring in Mr. Steve Valentine. How are you doing, Steve? There he is. Look at that. Sound effects not included. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no extra we charge. Give you the soundtrack beforehand. <laughs> it's not, it should be a soundtrack to this. That would be amazing. Or you should have like a thousand magicians going. <laughs> coming in. <laughs> we just layer every episode. It gets layered more and more from each guest more, more, to more, do until, it. until that's the entire episode. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That'd be amazing. Hello, lads. How are you? What a surprise to well, you. Yeah, yes. Fantastic. Yeah, fancy seeing you here. Yeah, you come here often? No, no, you know, I'm uh I'm over 40, mate. So, you know, I'm in bed by 9. So, this is uh ah, this, this is this is called the internet. <laughs> yeah. This is the uh, this is the internet, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I yeah, literally yeah. what I'm I did. The, I, I just got a MySpace account, so I'm happy <laughs> yeah. about that. That's uh, yeah. excited. To yeah, we've been we've around. been blowing up MySpace, letting them <laughs> know about this, I this heard show. Timberlake is bringing it back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it deserves yeah. a comeback. Yeah, Tarantino is going to make a movie starring yeah. MySpace. So that's the next that's thing that's coming out. Yeah, are we are we on the eyelines now. <laughs> All right. So we are so excited to have you here, Steve. So um, we, uh, oh, we'd like to talk you with you about your, sure. well, first off, we'd love to talk with you about your journey. You know, uh, as Ryan always says, you know, um, at any point, you know, if we wanted to, to ask you questions, you know, we could, we could call you up and, you know, and have, have a long chat. But we also love yeah. to give the opportunity for uh, people in our live chat to be able to, uh, to jump in and ask questions. And uh, we actually oh, just brilliant. had someone from the, uh, the Twitch chat jump in and, uh, and say, no way is the magician for a Waverly Place movie and the guy from I'm in the band. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, Do you know, you so, never know, because I've been around, for, honestly, I've been around for so long. I, let me, uh, no one know. I never know when someone comes up to me where they're going to say that they know me from. And it's always something like really obscure that I, I'm like, how would you, if, I was in Argentina once and I was at a concert, mm -hmm. shooting in Argentina in 2008. And these two like 17, 18 year old teenagers with ears in their hands come up to me and they're like, we know you, we know you from television. And I'm like, oh, what? So they're like, you guest starred on House. And I'm like, how would you? <laughs> how would you? I mean, I mean, <laughs> one is Iris. So the idea that the guy who looks like the guy is actually the guy. And yet they were so like, it was, yeah, that happens all the That's time. Incredible. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah. But yeah, Wizard of Waverly Place. That was me. Wizard of Waverly what Place. Did say? Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Cause that's a funny thing. I know I've talked about you to friends of mine and and said, oh, you know, you know, Steve Valentine, he's been in like everything. Uh, and then, you know, now I go to like The Walk because that that movie was was epic. And uh, that was good. I mean, you've appeared on it. Like if we had to list out, I mean, I've been watching television shows and then all of a sudden you walk on screen and I'm like, yeah, hey, I know that guy. <laughs> it's Yeah. It's yeah. Crazy. I, yeah, I get, I get, you know, I think it was a Rob Lowe who said that being an actor is just a series of bad haircuts, which is so true because, you know, as you get older and you've been in more stuff, you look back and you go, oh my God, that was my hair. <laughs> then that just becomes yeah. the, you know, my basic memory of it all. But it's, um, yeah. Yeah. You have, know, you have you ever, have you ever just walked downstairs and just, you know, something's playing on TV and you just see yourself and you're like, wait, what did I, I did that? <laughs> Yeah, I, there's every now and then I'll be like a line of dialogue and I'll be like, either oh, I hit that or I'll be like, oh, I could have done that so much better. I was in a <laughs> yeah. Vegas casino once years ago and this woman, um, she's absolutely true story. She came up, she slapped me in the face. She's just like, that's for you. And I'm like, whoa, what was that about? She goes, I saw you here earlier and I was up in my room and I heard your voice and I was like, oh yeah, he's followed me to my room. And then when I came out of the shower, it was just you on a TV show. And she was so pissed <laughs> off that she walked up and slapped me. Uh, but nowadays, so, I have her arrested, but, yeah. but we won't go there. Yeah, yeah exactly. But you let her slide on that one. 
But that's amazing I'll that you, you have your out. hand in so yeah. many different, you know, ver you know, so many different sects of entertainment. And uh, so for you, yeah. did your passion for magic or acting come first? What, what was, you know, what was the bug that got you into just being an entertainer regardless? That's a really good question. I mean, I remember it, I, to me, it all kind of happened at the same time. I think it was just a desperate attempt to be noticed. And uh, I, I remember my mate at school, Robert Allen, he and I, and he was about six or seven. He told me about this dancing school he was going to, and they get to do shows. And he's one of like three boys and there's 30 girls. And even at that age, I was like, oh, really? Um, I remember, so I remember <laughs> joining the dancing school. And then I, and then I remember this kid, this kid showing me a trick around about that time. I'd be pestering him until he showed me I was done. So it was all, it was all just kind of part of entertainment. And that's what I've always tried to do. And except for one 10 year period of my life, like I've always done everything I want to do, even though I might not be able to do it. I kind of had a tendency to jump in um, and ask questions later, you know, that's kind of me. So, hmm. uh, you know, like I'll write, I started writing scripts, I started selling uh, series or, or like right now I literally just taught myself how to write a comic book because I had this idea for a comic nice. uh called super and I had this and it's and I wrote it like I wrote the treatment for it in 2018 and then um Aftershock Comics which is a brilliant uh comic company they do amazing stuff and uh they agreed we made a deal and so now I'm writing it for them but writing a comic book is totally different to writing a screenplay because you have to be the the uh, the makeup artist you've got to be the the casting director you've got to do the hair you've got to do the cinematography yeah. you've got to figure out the shots that's all part of what you write so mm. i took the time out yeah. and taught myself that but i'm kind of learning as i go we've got an incredible artist uh, um uh, from rome and uh you know so but so yeah i just i'm like i want to do a comic book Let's did you go, grow up with a with that. a passion for comics or thing. did you grow up reading them or did you oh, just yeah. kind of spur them oh, okay yeah. so it wasn't just like oh you know maybe i should do a comic <laughs> it was it's something that up. you know you, you've been yeah, interested yeah, in. it wasn't it like uh, okay <laughs> you know i mean here i am i've got like this magic on the go school which we'll talk about where which is i'm uploading videos and all that kind of stuff but i've got i'm writing screenplays i've got a script i've got a thing out for which i'm um tv series that i'm pitching I'm acting and I decide I'm going to give myself something else to do, you know, uh, and, but when I was a kid, uh, I collected comics and I had a map. It's the classic story. I had a massive collection and my mom threw it out when I was away from home. Uh, mm -hmm. when I first moved to America, I remember yeah, calling her up and been like, you know, she's like, Oh yeah, I think we gave that to your brother. And then I think he gave it to his kids or they all got lost. But I had uh, like the original Avengers. I had a DC oh, comics, yeah. Batman. Wow. I, I mean, I had like all the 2000 wow. ADs. I just, I had everything, man. Clash of the Titans, <laughs> you name it. I had it. Right? The only thing I actually still have is a, is a Thor, the very first Thor mm. nerd alert. Really? I know, but the very really first Thor. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, the classic story. So I've always loved comics, always. Yeah, mm, really. Wow. I, I just imagine you just having like a bucket list of all the things in entertainment you haven't done yet, and you're just like, well, I haven't done comic books. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're almost at, <laughs> almost, at por almost at porn right now, but <laughs> chiseling away. <laughs> yeah. So well, we'll just, here's we'll the just, question. Someone will probably just do like, yeah. What? Tell me. Oh, well, relating to comic books. So like, if you were fascinated with comic books when you were younger. Does magic yeah. to you make you the closest to like a comic book hero as you possibly could be? Because I mean, I think that's the cool part about magic is like doing these things that normal people don't it, think that possible, right? Right. So I mean, yeah, it, it is. It is being for. that uh, you know, it is being that character. And um, who who was the who was it? Um, was it Kyle was doing? He kind of he's kind of done something like that where he's done. Oh yeah, yeah. He's Call mixed like magic tricks yeah. to the appearance of yeah to give the appearance of superhero powers which is mm. you know the right moment magic can be if someone doesn't know you're a magician and you do something weird that's yeah. that's the true power of magic right there and that's how mm. that's how cults are built right so, <laughs> um, yeah it's a very yeah yeah with great power comes great irresponsibility <laughs> comic books <laughs> porn then cult <laughs> you're on your way yeah, yeah. that's yeah, Steve's yeah, next project yeah. if covid continues <laughs> uh which you're in Toronto, to <laughs> so I mean, we may I be on lockdown here forever, right? So, any over up in Canada? Uh, yeah, because they don't seem to be doing anything else about it. No, in no. they're not really bothering yeah. to really get people vaccinated, or you know, it's just like you know what? 
they go like this. They go, we're in the middle of the lockdown, but we've decided it hasn't worked. So we're going to do more lockdown. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the that's definition that's of insanity. Uh, the, but the, God, the man, you know, my kids are home from school. I've got a nine and a five-year-old. What? Oh, I was going to say the best quote so far from the Canadian government has been, uh, there is absolutely zero cases of the flu this year because everybody has been social distancing, wearing their masks and sanitizing. And then the next sentence is COVID is at an all time right. high, though, because we're not social distancing and we're not wearing our masks. <laughs> it's like it doesn't make what, any sense whatsoever. That? It doesn't yeah. make any well, well, yeah. I mean, you can get to a whole conspiracy show. That's a whole nother show. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Spectacular. Yeah. Wow. Uh, How about where you me. are, Blaze? Is there is there, is there like three cases of COVID where you are? I mean, it's it's interesting. So I'm over in Connecticut right now. Um, and previously uh, I spent a lot of of after the beginning of lockdown last year, starting in March until November, I was over in Vegas and yeah. I mean, I feel like over there, people are just going to Vegas to forget that there's a virus and uh, and still not recognizing the fact that they're just bringing the virus home when they come back. But like it's, yeah. uh, you know, over here, I was surprised by how how much normalcy there is comparatively to places like L.A., you know, because um, over there, it's like there's there's so much locked down that and especially at, at the beginning of the new year, they went back to the same lockdown that they had at the beginning in March, which I guess you guys are used to because you've right. been through that a million times over in, over in Canada. <laughs> <We've been locked laughs> down. <laughs> yeah. Um, but over here, I, I mean, it's, it's like rather mind. normal. Yeah, it is. Well, as a mate of mine out here in Calgary who got COVID in March of 2020, but kind of mm. right before people realized, right before the kind of big explosion. Mm. And he goes to the doctor and he says, uh, I'm feeling really so bad. So they're like, we'll do some tests. And they come back to him and the doctor's like, listen, listen, we don't know what it is, but you've got a version of the flu that's just, whoa, super virulent, super, you've got rest. I'm gonna give you a prescription for Tamiflu, just kind of this over the counter mm. thing. He gets the Tamiflu and it helps him get better. So, mm. you know, and, and then like a couple of weeks later, the doctor calls him back up and goes, you had COVID. Did you know that? That was COVID is what you had. And then we were mm. like, into, so, you know, if you, if you feel like you got it and, you know, try some Tamiflu. That was, mm. you know, little advice for you. But, uh, you know, don't blame me. And that's kind of on your own <laughs> danger. Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. At your own risk. At your own you know, risk. Medical I, I think that there's also, there's also yeah, an element Tamiflu. of the fact that if you, if you go to a doctor and you have all of these symptoms yeah. and then the doctor comes back and says to you, we have no idea. I've never seen this before. That's so <laughs> much worse than getting even the worst yeah. possible diagnosis. If you get any kind of diagnosis and they're like, we've seen this before, here's the course of action. That eases yeah. your mind so much more than just this unknown chaos of like, oh, we have no idea, you know? And so yeah, I feel like there might the be time. even a, a psychological element of, you know, at least the fact that he got something that he felt was helping make him better. He felt a bit yeah. better. Absolutely. And, and, you know, you'd be surprised that I, I've, I met a doctor once who his, his job was he was the uh, unexplained disease wing or something of a hospital. You know, every hospital has a doctor who deals with cases of stuff. No idea what it is. And, and you'd be surprised how much how much of that exists out there. I had no idea that was a That's thing. Scary. There was there was a wing a, of yeah. uh, we're just there's a, yeah, there's always we're a, the troubleshooters. We don't know what yeah. this is. We're gonna yeah. send you down to this guy. You're, you're sick. Of, yeah, yeah. Come see us. We don't know either, but we'll have a look. It's kind of <laughs> just the shaman department. <laughs> just, <laughs> just send it to the mystic to try and solve yeah. it a different way. Have you have you tried mushrooms yet? All right, come <laughs> you to, try to the desert. We'll go that way. Oh, yeah. that's hilarious. <laughs> Wow, but off of the off of the COVID oh, yeah. train. Anyway. So so yeah, growing yeah. up, yes. you you read you joined the dance school <laughs> yeah. and got into into that. So you, it was it was with dance, and um, so assu I'm assuming was that prior to getting into magic at all was uh, was getting into to no, dance it was and all, acting all the same. or same. And then, uh, mm. No, it was all it was all the same. It was the magic, the dance, the acting, um, and uh, we did like a, a show every year. Uh, the dance school did, and then I understood I could get an extra five minutes in the show if I put the magic together. And so, you know, this kind of group. So I put the act together, and I was doing like kids parties. And and at ten, I was in. I was lucky enough to. Um, I, I competed in this magic competition when the movie Magic came out with Anthony Hopkins, which was mm -hmm. uh, uh, or 
which was going to really date me. And uh, they had this magicians to promote the movie. This theater had a, had a magician competition. And I didn't realize there were so many magicians in South End. So I met all these guys. And because I was 10, I won it because I was a kid. Um, and, but I met um, a magician called Dick Turpin, who became my mentor. And he was an old itinerant street performer. I think he must have been 70 or something when I met him. And he was like, you've got to come down to the South End Sorcery Society. And it's adults only, but we'll see if we can get you in. You know, So I went in and met everybody. And they let me join. And that was, well, that was amazing because at that time, and I didn't realize it, but I was surrounded by some real legends of magic and not really appreciating as a kid, you don't, you're 10, how can you? But people like um, like Bob Reed and uh, Morris Fogel came to lecture and these kind of like great names of the 70s, 60s, 70s and 80s. And there was a guy called Jimmy Rogers who was friends with Will Goldston. So that's how far back he went. He went back to like the thirties and forties. Um, wow. And, you know, so there were, I was just surrounded by it. And I, and I wish I'd asked the questions that I really wished I could have asked them. <laughs> I think of now, you know, yeah. I mean, there's questions I wish I'd asked Billy McComb, you know, when I knew him that I'm thinking, mm -hmm. oh, why didn't I ask Billy about this? So, uh, but it was, that was an amazing experience. Yeah. And then, and then mm -hmm. at about 18, I went to Yugoslavia for two, for two years. Um, to do to work at a night, I got an opportunity to work at a nightclub uh, oh. for British-speaking tourists, and I had to just do two shows a night uh, and DJ. But but the shows had to be different for for twelve nights, so that would be twenty-four acts. Wow! Um, and I could do anything wow. I wanted. I could do anything. I could be, I could get up on stage and do like a lovely legs competition, or you know anything anything I wanted to do. So I did as much magic as I could. I took all this magic over mm. with me, and then. Um, and I was probably like drunk for two years, you know, just kind of, I ran the bar and I was 18, you imagine 18, like 18 being in a, in, in a resort and just kind of had, yeah. And just kind of had a place yeah. where I could go and be bad really. And yeah. that was an yeah. amazing experience. Do you find that was really formative? Cause you know, it, it, like, uh, it, you know, um, Lance Burton in his booklet advice that, that he put out for young magicians, he talks about how, you know, you need to find your Hamburg, yeah. how like, you know, the Beatles when they were starting out, had a residency in Hamburg, Germany, where they could just yes. be bad and get good. Do you feel like that was where you really got your reps in yeah. and became who you are? I, absolutely. Because I, yeah, well, I, I, yes and no. I mean, I think that the early years at the castle when I was doing 21 shows or maybe 30 shows a week in the close-up room where we used to jam it, um, those, uh, that really was the, the kind of the, the mm. trial by fire, training by fire. But in mm. Yugoslavia, yes, because... I died. So I, I died on my butt so much, but it didn't matter. You know, unfortunately, now you got you have one bad show. It's going to be on the internet. I think that um, I, I have so many memories of like literally one night I went out. I could not get anyone on stage. No one. And I was like, if I can't get anyone on stage, I can't continue the show. And it was like silence. <laughs> I was like, all right then, and I walked off. <laughs> and just play music wow. with the rest. Like, what are you going to do? Wow. You know, I can't get. You know, I remember this guy came up to me and he had a. He had a videotape and he goes, well, we recorded the show tonight. And I was like, oh, okay. And he goes, I, I, I want you to have it. And I was like, no, keep it as a souvenir of the vacation. He goes, nah, it's all right. You, you have it. I'm good. <laughs> and then you just like, and then you have nights where you hit it and you're like, what did I do? What was different? What was the, you know, now you, because it was just me. I didn't have anyone out there really to, to give me notes, but yeah. I did meet a kid who was eight years old at that point. He came on vacation with his dad and I'm, and this kid was like really into magic, reminded me of me when I was that age. And so I met him and his parents every day and I sat and I taught him a couple of tricks and I took him backstage. And anyway, so he grew up uh, to become a magician. And uh, uh, he sent me a message a few years back saying, you don't remember me, but I'm doing a show in the West End right now. And uh, you guys know Jamie Allen? You know Jamie? Yeah. He's doing the Illusionarium the in, in Toronto oh. now. Yeah, 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 the eye magician. Yeah, yeah. So this was Jamie. And Jamie was like, you don't remember me. But I, and, and so he was in town, what, six months ago as he's opening up the Illusionarium. And he's like, so I haven't seen this kid since I was 18 and he was eight, right? Or some, something along those lines. So I go down to Illusionarium, he's showing me everything, and there's this little plaque on the wall where he thanks me for spending time with him when he was a kid. It got very emotional. You never know oh, really? when, you're, wow. when you're out there, when you're, you, know, you meet a kid or you meet someone, you give them a little bit of your time, you never know how important that is you know, to, to that person. 
and and he as we were talking it was like i remember i remember there were things that you did in the show and i was like i don't even remember the shows that i did well, you know because i remember you closed a show with the rice dagger trick and you know and i thought wow that you know and then you did the magnetic cards and and you had this trunk of props in the back which i completely forgot about i had this massive trunk I threw everything I had at home, including all my books, into this massive trunk and just thought, I'll figure it out when I get there. Um, and I remember showing, apparently I showed him the, 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 the trunk. So that was, an, that was pretty great. I probably would still be there now if, it, if the war hadn't come. And uh, I was recommended that, uh, that we leave, you know. But um, yeah, so that was, was a really great kind of coming of age, I think. And my Hamburg, definitely my Hamburg, yeah. But that's the that's the thing. Like I try to explain to so many young guys. Uh, I talk to a few young guys that are, you know, trying to start their careers now and stuff. And and I always tell yeah. them, like, you know, you need to do a thousand shows before you're like, okay, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then in your next thousand shows, you'll be you'll be better. You'll be like pretty good, right? And but like this is I what mean, we miss in yeah this this is what we miss in not having uh vaudeville or the cabaret the way that it used to be where they were doing eight shows a day right yeah. and you know we, we see a little bit of it if you go to the british pathé newsreels and you watch someone like uh arnold the bear do the egg bag mm -hmm. or howard uh, howard de Corsi doing his act these are guys who did their shows so much so many times that it's and this is where it has to be where the material that you're doing is so second nature that you almost can step out of your body while you're performing. I think Lance Burton once talked about he was doing his his dove act while he was trying to remember what he needed to get for dinner that night, you know, and <laughs> and, and that's kind of where he was. Mm -hmm. But you you have to be so in you have to know it so well that when an audience throws something at you, uh, well, first of all, it's it's never just about the trick, right? It's about your relationship with an audience. Always, it's about your relationship with the audience, and, and we hide behind the magic, but the magic should be here, and you you should be here with your audience. And if you know the trick so well that no matter what happens, you can go with it, then you've got the ability to step out of your patter, out of your rehearsal, and you can deal with this thing that's happening. A, a perfect example would be. Uh, when I was on tour with the Illusionist a couple of years ago, and we we're at this one theatre, and I have this trick called the chocolate box, and the idea is that the guy's on this side of the stage, and a woman's on the side of the stage, and he signs a coin and seals it inside this box, shakes it, and then it just disappears, and it appears folded up inside a dollar bill, inside a glass that she's holding on the other side of the stage, and then it travels back, and it's a very kind of uh, uh, the spacing is important because it sells the the journey of the coin. And so I'm like, all right, is it, I need a lady from the audience. And before I can get to my punchline of the joke, I'm going to say this woman stands up. She goes, I'm a lady. And she's like, 80 year old woman. And she's like, <laughs> and, I'm, and now I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to be, I'm going to be an ass if I tell her I can't use you. Right. So I'm like, okay, come on up then. And now of course she's coming up to the stage and I'm like, it's going to be forever, isn't it? It's going to take forever. <laughs> I'm like talking to the audience. Cause I knew what, I, I had a feeling whatever happened, I needed to get the crowd on my side. So sometimes just by talking about you know what's actually happening in, an, in a humble way you can kind of get them on your side you know so they know that you're actually dealing with something unusual so this woman yeah. so i'm like i'm like tick tock tick tock like here she comes well you're finally here okay i was going to shave come on up so we get her up on stage and she's the feistiest little thing so she's standing on one side of the stage and i give her the glass to hold and i would go across to the guy and as i turn around she's over my shoulder she literally just was was just wandering over and 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 i'm like no no get back to you. and the whole routine which is supposed to be just under 10 minutes went almost 20 uh which wasn't a good thing because we had so much fun but just like i was like treating her like a five-year-old i'm like get back to your get back to your seat get back <laughs> over there stand over there you know yeah. and she was hilarious but i knew the trick so well that it's possible to go with that flow right and if if now nowadays because the internet it eats up so much material you don't have a chance to do something a thousand times and, and, yeah. and get that comfortable with it right mm. there is yeah, no yeah. hamburg i don't know where you could possibly go uh other than that's the beauty of the magic castle it's one of the few places mm. that exists where you're doing three to four shows a night for seven days and you will come out at the end of that week as you know exhausted but better and honed yeah
Yeah, I feel like the closest thing I can think of is is you know have if you have consistent restaurant gigs, but it's not the same kind of show context. You know, it's not that you're performing a a show. You know, it becomes you know this kind of strolling like I have to set up right. a little mini show in this moment. But I feel like you know I'm I look back on that really fondly. You know, the the few years where I was you know had like you know three or four restaurants consistently every week and was just like grinding out that. And also what yeah. what you were talking about of how um, you know, you start off and you really are hiding behind the tricks at the beginning. And then you yeah. have to, you have, like, I, I realized at some point I need to continually change up my set because I'm finding myself becoming robotic. I'm getting yeah. too comfortable and I'm almost getting like trapped in this safety net of that. You know, I said these words this way and it worked for that table over there. And I right. just realized I said the exact same words in the exact <laughs> same way for this table. And I didn't talk yeah. to these people like real people at all. And so then I felt yeah. like I need I need to break out of that and allow myself to feel more comfortable and know that whatever happens, you know, I'll be able to, to get back on track because otherwise I, I'm not being present at all. And I felt like it was it was affecting their experience, but also it was it was affecting my own a lot. You know, I was I was like, it's so much more engaging yeah. if I'm actually being a human talking to you rather than just going through these recited lines. Every time. You know? Yeah. There's a there's an audience can sense whether you're performing at them or with them mm. and whether you're reciting something and uh I, I remember when I did I did this one man show for a while, Life and Other Deceptions and the first 20 minutes of the show is like a regular magic show. And then it goes, it goes, uh, makes a left turn. And what I wanted it to be was, um, cause it goes into narrative. And what I wanted the moment to be is the first 20 minutes, just like kick ass magic, fast, funny, nonstop. And then at some point I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't do this. Mm. I can't fucking do this. And just go, can you put the lights up please? And really have that pregnant pause where mm. people are not are thinking something's actually going down. Mm. And, um, and then I'd explain to everyone how I quit magic for 10 years and I'm back on stage there and I'm really just like sit standing here as I'm performing, just thinking like, why am I doing this? Am I back on stage? You know what? Let me tell you why. Grab a chair, put it in the middle of the stage, sat down in the chair, pin spot. And I started telling them a story and I can't tell you the number of people that will come up to me and go, yeah, we like the magic, but when you stopped, and actually talked to us that's when we leaned in mm. and it was the the greatest lesson uh so then you know a couple of months later i'm at the i'm at the close-up room at the castle and i'm thinking about this i'm like all that work that went into the first 20 minutes of the show when i when i go out i'm like rigged <laughs> like a like a you know i've got so many pools and stuff on me i'm like an underground map it's just like it's crazy and I'm thinking all that work, and yet the thing that they really responded to was when I sat down and was real. But always in my close-up show, I used to come out and go bam right into the first trick. So I made an experiment, and I had a glass of water instead. And I would come out with a glass of water, and I would just take my moment and just say hello to everyone, look around the room, how you guys doing? All right, everything, everything okay? You good? You good? I would always listen at the curtain in case somebody said something, you know, facetious. I could come back. To it. But just that <laughs> moment of coming in, putting the cards down, putting the glass down looking at everybody before I started, like, it not only relaxed me, but I felt the audience go, ah, oh. you know, I felt the connection. And I think that's what we have to strive for more now than ever. I think the audience is really thirst for us to break that fourth wall mm. in the right environment, mm. right? It's got to be in the right environment. I mean, you can't go do a corporate gig, come out and go like, <laughs> My dad died when I was 16. You know, then it's not going to work. You got to know your audience. You got to have that's, that's when you come out and you go, right, here we yeah. go. Boom, boom, boom. As, as just as yeah. a as a uh, challenge, just set the, just have to dig your way out of this hole you've just yeah. put yourself That's going to be the new opening monologue yeah. for I always, a ton of magicians now. They're going to walk out and be like, so my dad passed away when I was 16. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so my hemorrhoids are flaring up. You know, something like completely <laughs> you know, just kind of come out and go, uh, uh, do you know what? I, I was, I almost didn't make it. I was panicking backstage, but it's all right. I checked with the wife. We had beats last night. Anyway, uh, good <laughs> evening. Oh, uh, are you, are you a fan of James and Acaster at all? It's completely. Uh, yeah, I love James. Uh, yeah, I love James. But I tell you who I really love. And I think, 
I, I mentioned this in the, to Jeff McBride the other night. Um, to me, the perfect example of, of how we should, not should, how we could aim to be uh, the style of a magician and how we uh, can uh, not hide behind props, but use them. And also how, you, how we can use our entire bodies in the performance. Because again, right, magic, the energy is here, right? Your focus is, it's always about the trick and I'm back here. But uh, really the whole thing has to be the whole body. Um, is if you watch Bo Burnham, who I'm a massive oh, fan of, uh, yeah. like to me, like Bo Burnham Huge is, fan. yeah, no, it's unbelievable. Yeah. I was just, just the other day I was watching Happy again. Uh, no, mm. what, what, Mate, sorry. Um, oh, um, what, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, so to me, like Bo is, is, if you did a magic act and you was as connected with your material and it had the pace and the power of Bo's show, that to me is something to aim for. Uh, and, and that he was an inspiration when I did Life and Other Deceptions. It didn't quite hit what I wanted to hit, but um, but definitely that that kind of fast paced multimedia, um, non stop left turn, right turn, left turn. Even when there's a pause between bits, it's not really a pause between bits. It there's yeah. there's something else that's there. The whole thing is it keeps you on the edge of your seat. That's yeah, which is but you know, when I was watching him the other day thinking like he's so blue right he's so like the material is and as magicians we get the rough end of the stick because i mean all right there's something about performing clean and a lot of people love that and that's great but bo burnham packs out the theaters and when people go to his shows they know that it's going to be political it's going to be edgy he's got this character on stage that says all the wrong things but as magicians, it's unfair because if we go on stage and do that stuff, it, we get hammered for it, right? Mm -hmm. I don't, it's, I feel like we're, we're the, the one profession that isn't allowed to be magic, to do, to do um, kind of blue material within the magic profession and also kind of outside of the magic profession. And I wonder if that's something to do with the, the fact that magic is a, creates a, like a childlike wonderment in some people and they feel like that. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I was mm -hmm. thinking about that. Uh, that kind of, it's, you know, I would love to go out there and be Bo Burnamy, you know, and go, <laughs> yeah. and go as, you know, be really real. I, I, I remember I did in, the, in Life and Other Deceptions, I, I made a point to not taper my language and, uh, and I had some pretty raunchy lines in there, you know, and then one guy reviewed it online and he goes, it's a shame that he cusses so much in the show. But I'm sure this guy, you know, watched a whole bunch of comedy specials and didn't think twice about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I saw your show uh, in LA. I saw opening night. Uh, with, oh, did you? Uh, <laughs> with Patrick Kuhn and uh, yeah, Jeremy Griffith, because uh, me and Patrick were in LA uh, mm. releasing the deck of cards I was releasing and uh, and shooting a couple projects with Patrick and stuff. So we yep. came to opening night, and I remember <laughs> we were driving back. I had to leave to go back to Canada the next day, and so we were driving from yeah. L.A. back to Vegas after your show, and I was like, oh, it's opening night. It'll probably be an hour and a half. Like, it'll be done. And the first night was like three hours the time we got out of there. It was crazy, yeah. but it was amazing. It was nice. And I still remember oh, thank you. Uh, you brought me up on stage, well, like uh, up to the front for, uh, for a routine. Uh, and I came yeah. back to my seat, and after the show, Patrick and Jeremy, who are both brilliant guys, both asked me, they were like, so how did Steve do it? Like, you're one of the only guys, like, with, you know, brilliant scripting, storytelling, and everything else in that that we appreciated. Oh, thank but you. still fooled the pants off of the magicians that were in the room uh, with a card trick uh, at the end of the day uh, that we, we were like, I was like, ah, I, I think he must have done it. That was probably way. the, um, thank you. Yeah, it's probably the poker deal, right? I imagine it was. It was, it was uh, three of us, up, you know, like three the... people up on stage. Yeah. Uh, and Psychic yeah, it was, poker, yeah. Yeah, it was stupid. It was so stupid. Uh, but I'd be like, and <laughs> I mean that, that in the I, best I, well, way. Well, thank you. I mean, thanks yeah. for saying that. I'd never done that. It was the first time I'd ever performed that. So you can imagine, you know <laughs> what it feels like when you do an act and you slide in, you slide in one new trick. Yeah. And you're like, right. So imagine 95 yeah. percent of that show was brand new and and mm -hmm. we hadn't had much rehearsal time. We hadn't been able to get the theater. We were under such a, a squeeze to get the show out. We hadn't even had a, um, a complete run through because every time we tried to have a run through, we had trouble with the equipment. Uh, props broke. Um, 
literally at three in the morning that day, opening day, I had a Tommy Wonder ring watch wallet and the gimmick broke <laughs> and a piece of the, the, the metal gimmick flew in the air, landed on the stage, bounced twice and went between the floorboards. And, and I was just like, uh, this is, that isn't the universe telling me to quit, you know? And a number <laughs> of people were like, Steve, we haven't, we haven't run the show once with all the cues. Uh, we think you should maybe not go on tonight. And I was like, no, you know what? I'll deal with whatever happens. It'll keep me on my toes. Uh, and it was, yeah, I, that was the first time I'd ever done that poker deal. And yeah. it, was it was terrifying because it's, a, it was, for those who, who don't good. know the nap, it, <laughs> it's called, the, it's based on a trick called the nap hand. So a deck of cards is shuffled, three hands are, are, are dealt out while, this, while the uh, magician is blindfolded. He plays the entire game. And whoever has the worst hand, that's uh you know so whoever's got the worst hand i'll make sure that you win and so uh i it's a trick that goes back to the 20s that used to be done with a game called nap which no one plays right and the good thing about nap is there's no throwing cards away and drawing you just play with the cards that you're dealt and it's like trumps or, or rummy it's a bit like trumps or rummy so for years i've always wanted to do this trick i saw david nixon my old uh, uh, I kind of loved David Nixon when I was an old TV magician do it years ago. And um, so finally I came for the show. I was like, I'm going to come up with this. I'm going to come up with a method where they can throw cards away and draw cards off and give the impression that that final hand of cards changes into a royal flush. That was what I wanted to do. So in the scripting, uh, there is this whole thing about your hand sucks. You don't even have enough for a pair, not even an ace. There's nothing in there. He only gets a couple of cards and at the end I go, look at your hand, you've now got the Royal Flush. And it seems like a hands off. So that was the idea of it. It's um, it's a long ass routine, man. I think it's something like yeah. eight minutes, which is, you know, it's a, it's a once you, it's one of those things that, you know, those routines, once you launch into them, you know, you've now got eight minutes of this, this and <laughs> it's like you're about to, it's like jumping off mm. and starting the journey. Yeah. But thank you for that. That's very nice. I'm yeah, glad you were there yeah. for that. I'm glad wow. we survived it. Yeah, no worries. And then you talk about the, uh, the chocolate box, and I've seen you perform that as well uh, at Magic Live. Uh, you did it. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a good segue to go into, because I talked to you this week about how much research you put in, uh, you know, how many hours you spent in the library, uh, you know, at the castle or yourself in your own yeah. library and stuff. Uh, because I remember you talking about the chocolate box and you were like, oh, I had to research back and back and back and no one knew the method and stuff. And so can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the chocolate box is a fascinating trick. So, you know, it all started when um, Alan Shackson, who's this old English magician and a bunch of other people have said to me over the years that you have to, that when you want to do a trick, it's always good to kind of research all the methods that happened. Uh, look at all the way that it's all the ways that it's been done and then see if you can come up with a, your own better way or at least an amalgamation of what's out there right so when I was doing the show I knew I wanted to have like a, a patter piece up front and I knew I didn't want it to be a card trick at that point because I have so much card stuff coming so um, I was reading some old magazines and like I just I was looking for something else and I, I really researched the you know, magic wand, the gen, the sphinx. I go way back all the old magic books into the 18, uh, late 1800s, all the way through. And when you're researching one thing, you'll find something else. And you're like, oh, I'll make a note of that. Well, I kept coming across this reference to this guy's chocolate box trick that he learned from David Devant, although it was never published. And uh, so I'm, I thought it's written up in Greater Magic. Fantastic. So I go to Greater Magic and the method doesn't work. And then I'm like, well, this sucks because that kind of I could start off by throwing chocolates out and it would be really cool, but it didn't work. And then I read, oh, there's another method. It's written up in uh, one of Will Goldstone's books and slightly differently, but the method still doesn't work. And uh, I'm like, this, this really, this is like a big tease. Finally, Peter Warlock <laughs> wrote, wrote in an article of his that this trick was deliberately described uh, falsely, wrongly, because the Arthur Sherwood, who was the guy who invented it, um, didn't want it in print, but everyone kept coming to him and saying, can we have it for our books? Can we have it for this? Can we have it for that? And so he'd give them deliberately uh, obtuse versions so that they made them happy, but he could still, he was still the only person who would ever, you know, so I eventually found out what the real method was. And then I adapted that, but it took, it was, it was quite a journey. And it was like researching cards to pocket and coming across 
and then going making a left turn into into chocolate box um but it was during the research of that that i really i was coming across so much great material and so many great secrets of magic that are kind of getting lost because they're tucked away in magazines or old pamphlets that we could barely see that uh, i started making notes and keeping lists and then that from that and like, i'd love to share some of this stuff so I put together C2P, which was the cards to pocket DVD set that I put out, which was insane because that was like <laughs> seven discs. It was 122 videos or something. Yeah. I don't know, ridic ridiculous. Um, and yeah. that was uh, yeah, it was hours upon hours. I mean, I, I forget how much it was. It was, I was there was going to be an eighth disc, but my wife was like, that'll do, pig. That'll do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she was filming it. Um, and so then I decided that, you know, so I, so I started putting the stuff out, but DVD is such an expensive, archaic method of disseminating information. That's when I got into magic on the go. And I was like, you know what? Subscription services are coming in. I can keep the price really low. I can put material out that is either my own or something that I think should be uh, treasured and remembered or a variation of, of something, you know, um, and, um, and it's immediate. It's, that's what I love about it. It's immediate. It's out there. So there's a record. And so I did start doing that four years ago and all the research. And I still do right now. I'm doing a whole thing on egg bag, which you would not believe how much stuff has been published and is out there. Uh, I've discovered on egg bag, just different kinds of bags and handlings and eggs. And there are routines with signed eggs, which if you think about it, uh, I don't think I've ever seen anyone have an egg signed, but it, it ups the power of the trick quite mm. substantially when the mm. egg that's signed vanishes from over here and appears in a bag over here. Now it's yeah. the, the, the power of the trick has gone up. Um, so I found all these other methods, you know, so now uh, I'm doing a whole thing on, on the egg bags. There's like 200 things I'm filming right now, which is nuts. Mm. Um, and we can you are tell 600, 600 videos, videos on, on Magic I was gonna say, on the How many videos? You're on number 600, yeah. which is insane. Well, it's, I say 600, uh, if I, if I go into the system, it tells me 701, but I, I, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that some of those, uh, might be duplicates. So I want to be conservative in my estimate of 600. So that's, uh, yeah, that's where we are. And that's, that's just, uh, oh my God, coin magic, card magic, it's like original stuff as well. Uh, as well as, yeah, it really is. And it's because I want to, I'll give you an example, like cards across, right? I think there's 20 methods of cards across on there, but what's important is, I took something like Paul Patassi's cards across, which we have video of them performing in the 50s or 60s in black and white and French and television. I found this video of him on YouTube and analyzed it and dissected his, his performance, which was different to what he did on the DVD set that came out later, right? So now I was able to dissect it and, and teach the proper rhythm and, 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 and just kind of take my time and say, look, look, look how he handles this. This is a guy who did this trick thousands of times. Look at the natural misdirection here. See how, you know, and kind of really, uh, uh, we stand on these shoulders, right? So we should, we should give a nod to them. So I love doing that. We've got 24 methods of diminishing cards, which is one of my favorite all time stand up pieces. Cause it's just naturally funny, believe it or not. You don't have to do much, much with it. Um, and uh, yeah, so much. I had a, I had a teaching on the chocolate box. There was like a three hour teaching, mm. uh, five videos on chocolate box, and then with everything, including the big finale where you pour chocolate <laughs> out of the box into the person's hand. And then I could I came up with this method at the very end of it of showing the box empty. You wasn't when you saw the show. It wouldn't have been in there then at that yeah. point. But there's a method where you show the box empty, and at the very end you pour the chocolate out on their hands. Um, and then I took it off because. I mean, I, I share like 99% of my material on there, but there was this thing inside of me. It was like, it's too soon. I don't I want to, you know, so that one, I'm still on. using that one. <laughs> You're like, uh, this is really, you no, know, I should have done that. Right. Box. I should have said, yeah. Yeah. You just get to the end. And you're like, this is oh, how it's done. Yeah, the method's done. <laughs> yeah. 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 I should have done that. But, but it's been, it's a great, it's been a great journey. I, I'm uploading new stuff all the time. Um, I, I've got a thing on, um, vanishing birdcage that I'm putting together. And this guy called Cecil Keach, who was like a magician from the 1930s, who came up with some lovely material and including a kind of a cups and balls, but with tubes. And I managed to track down a set from the fifties. These are his actual tubes, not his, but these, these were sold by Harry Stanley back in the fifties and sixties. And what's brilliant about these is 
you can do like a chop cup or uh, 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 cups and balls routine. You can see that right there. Uh, but there are these three tubes and you can move these things around. They can find the ball. They can't find the ball. But you can see right through it. So um, there's no place for magnets, not magnets. And yet you can make a ball appear or disappear inside the tubes, which is great. So I'm working on that, you know, his a lot of his material kind of I like to remember these guys. And That's those. amazing because I feel like most people will study magic with the the intent of oh I, I have this idea that I want to do in my show so I'm going to research that you know just in that specific lane or you know I'm going to study this thing with the intent of trying to perform that but it seems as though you just have this voracious need to continue studying and then sharing the things that are, you know is is it a fear of the fact that they may be forgotten otherwise you know yeah. and, and you want to yeah, put absolutely. it into, to further it yeah, that's really it, incredible it really it really is because I know that I'm not going to use all this material, but I can tell you that just by studying a trick that may have nothing to do with my act, I might get something out of it. I might have an idea, a piece of rhythm, a bit of business, a, you know, a method that I can apply to something else. And, you know, the, like the idea of the signed egg, immediately I'm like, well, if you did a Carlisle pocket switch with a signed egg, I could do an egg to pocket. You know, mm. instead of doing cars to pocket, maybe I could do two or three eggs to pocket, which would be really fun because mm. now I'm like, don't be very careful when you reach in and pull out. You know, you could get a lot of comedy out of that. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's about, you know, I, I'll give an example. I, I don't mind giving this away because it's, it's super old. But there was a trick called the dissolving card, which was where you took a playing card and you switched it for a plastic card under a handkerchief. And they pushed it into a glass of water and they took the handkerchief away. The card was gone, right? Never see any, no one does it anymore. It used to be in all the old magic trick sets from the 1920s, um, but no one does it anymore. So I worked, I worked, and then I came across this, this guy published an idea for the vanishing card and I just kind of did a handling of it. And basically you imagine if you've got like a signed card here and uh, let me just lower the table. I've got one of these fabulous lowering, raising and lowering desks, right? So imagine you're right here and you can cover the, um, cover the card like that, right? Nice and cleanly. So all I just basically just did was come up with a, with a handling, hand comes away, bring the spectator closer. And now what I'm able to do is to just go one, two, three, wave that and the card has gone and mm. it's on his back. And this mm. simp and this this came from just thinking about oh, this old this old method, because I can do, I can hold the card, the, the two of them together here, it can be signed, right? and then do a back, immediately do a back palm as I put this underneath mm. so that it's, my hand comes away clean, see? Mm. And then bring the spectator over and stick this underneath his collar. So the card goes under his collar. And what's amazing, what I discovered from this old magazine bit was that if you have a plastic card under here and you go like that, people don't see the card fall, mm. right? <laughs> so you have this amazing vanishing handkerchief, you know, and you can like toss the handkerchief out, card vanishes and it's on the guy's back. It's a great bit of business. It's a great routine. And, you know, and I've got the idea from like, I think an old, uh, like a 1910 manuscript. Wow. Crazy. You know, Crazy. So this is, yeah, I get excited about this stuff because I think it's, it, there's some very, very clever stuff out there. We shouldn't forget it. Wow. No, definitely, definitely. When you said you did, you've had Magic on the Go for four years. <laughs> yeah. And you've done 600 videos. So you're doing a video every other day. Essentially, it's like 150 videos a year. So just under a video every other day. So like close, to maybe a video every three. Days. Yeah, kind of. I have. If you look at if you well, you're a math guy, nerd. Okay, so, so yeah. here's the thing, right? I've got <laughs> no. The good thing is, is that the stuff that I already filmed is on there as well. Yeah. So there's oh, 120 really, yeah. videos from C2P. That's that's all on there. There's the stuff from the card through handkerchief thing I did before that, which was yeah. some 30 or 40 videos on various methods of card through handkerchief. My own method of card through handkerchief. Booked is on there. Three is on there. My three card Monty. My pretentious, which is my blank packet trick. That's on there. So that those things were kind of like the core beginning of uh, of the thing and then yeah and then it was just literally yeah. i would upload in the early days of this 20 or 30 pieces a month because i wanted wow. to really i wanted to build the database you know yeah. uh, i've got some i've got and then i'm also doing these things called past masters which is really fun right it's kind of a more podcasty vibe where i'll sit and read the words of some 
old time magician mm. that are as relevant today as they are as they were then. And, uh, and that's a lot of fun. I just did one called What's Wrong With Magic, which was written a hundred years ago. And uh, if you listen to it, it's, it's, you, it could have been written today. Mm. It's, it's wow. that relevant. It's, it's, oh. kind of, it's brilliant, you know? So uh, there's a lot of historical stuff on there as well. So I believe that you have to immerse yourself in the subject in order to be the best you can be. I mean, who knows when you're at a gig, you might, you're giving that break and you may need to switch to an impromptu method, you know, and you'll be super glad that you rehearsed it. Mm. Just have that, just have yeah. that, just have <laughs> that ever expanding repertoire just in the back, you know, it, I mean, it's just yeah. every, everything that you learn is another, you know, tool in your tool belt and you not, you might never need that wrench, but the one day that, it, you know, there's something that, that you need it for, you know, you have it, you know, it's, it's ready. Yeah. I mean the poker <laughs> deal, right? So there's, there's, there's the main method that I do on stage, but there's ways it can go wrong. And uh, there's a lot of ways it can go wrong because you're not handling the deck. So uh, at any point, there's a lot of trust involved, but at any point, uh, the cards go all over the floor, uh, then I'm really screwed. So I have to go back to a method that was invented in the 20s, which were originally, it's a great method, but it just but I have to actually go off and get something and come back. So uh, in order for that to work, so I had to, um, a regular blindfold, but I had a steel blindfold off stage with what, everything else that I needed um, in case I had to go back to that method. And I, and I only used it once, but that one time, uh, yeah, it, and I was the one who dropped the cards. That was what was really annoying because it was me. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, but thank God I had that method ready, you know, and in case I needed it. Nice. We just got a, a message from, uh, from Billy the Kid, yeah. 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 Gentlemen, insane Billy magic kid. on the go is uh, Billy, <laughs> Billy kid. kid. Why did I say Billy the kid? Billy yeah, kid. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. she gets that a lot. Yeah. No, oh, she's thanks, <laughs> thanks, Billy. That's, yeah, she's been a big supporter. Awesome. She's been a big supporter of it. And uh, and Jeff, Jeff McBride just joined. He's uh, he's like finally. He's like I'm going to join. I'm going to join up and, <laughs> and uh, suck it all up. Yeah. Uh, well, Billy is great. Been, been, uh, so we're doing so a special actually. right now. Not a, mm -hmm. a special. That makes it sound. Yeah, no, Billy's brilliant. And she uses a lot of the material. She's got a lot of the material from that and adapted it and put it into her show. Mm -hmm. And she's someone who, again, um, I like the way she thinks because she never takes anything verbatim. She'll never do anything the way anyone else does it. If you've seen her show, you yeah. know that's true. Mm -hmm. It's like a diminishing cards is like the brilliant bit of entertainment, but really surreal. And, um, you know, she'll take the material and she'll adapt it, to, adapt it to her as well. But so, yeah, so because I was celebrating the 600 video, we... Um, we just ran this thing right now that you can get. So if anyone out there wants to kind of uh, access some of the videos on Magic on the Go and learn some magic for free, you can. You can just go to stevevalentine.com slash magic uh, yeah. and just uh, sign up. There it is. Don't forget the slash, as they say. Uh, there sign go. up. And uh, yeah, what's it? Oh, yeah, right. Wait, it's um, oh, the it's it opposite way. Yeah, it's always. Uh, yeah. 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 Stevevalentine.com uh, slash magic slash magic and just sign up there and you'll get into the email stream and there'll be a bunch of stuff sent to you yeah so there you go that's what we're doing with well, that thank you for that steve i mean that's incredible yeah. just for people to be able to access that i know like i met you 10 years ago probably maybe a little bit longer than that at yeah. sorcerer's safari yeah. magic camp uh in the middle of the woods oh, i think right. is where we met uh and you had your wife that, and i think yeah. you just had your daughter at that time maybe you guys she was about two so she's yeah. almost 10 now so it's about eight years ago yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, wow yeah that was that yeah. was great sorcerer of safari man i, I miss that i wish they bring that That's, i i it worked so at tannins a couple of years ago and i said there's you know tannins is like it's a whole different world it's like hogwarts and it's like you know you're basically staying in hogwarts and it but it's mm -hmm. magic all the time like every waking yeah. minute you're doing magic where uh and I, I said to them i said if i come back i want to help them run it more like sorcerer safari where the kids can get out of the classroom for like an hour <laughs> and and do capture the flag yeah or you know, soccer or something because i was like well you know what was, was fun a, though yeah i went on a cart ride uh like a golf cart ride and i found out that the school that uh that tannins was was at has this like huge soccer field, like it's gorgeous AstroTurf field and like a swimming pool and stuff. And I'm like, 
why why are we just stuck in the classroom for yeah. like eight hours a day like i mean the, the kids are amazing and they're learning a ton of stuff yeah. but you know we were able to go at, at sorcerer safari like you go jump in the lake and you know on the big yeah. bouncy thing and stuff and the yeah. late the late jump was great and then and the late jump was good but i do remember all these like all these um canoes and all this stuff that was available to the kids and but you go oh, down yeah. to the dock and you'd see all the kids you go to the dock and they'd just be sitting on the dock doing card tricks yeah, yeah <laughs> and they'd, 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 like, you know, they'd be by the soccer field doing card tricks that's that true. great that's why that's why they're there you know but yes you're right yeah. little outside uh, yeah. stimulus is always good because that's <laughs> when the good ideas come that's what I, I said to them. I said, just let them get out of the classroom. Because by the end of like three hours of their morning session, they're like zombies, especially by like Wednesday or Thursday in the week. Yeah. And I was like, let them get some endorphins going. Let them run around for an mm -hmm. hour and, you know, have some fun. Water balloon fight or something yeah. like that. You know, something that they can all do and, you know, no one can be good or bad at. But uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, but, and yeah. Also, we yeah. soak it up. That's when that's when everything you've learned gets a chance to sink in. And, and like I said, most of my good ideas come when I'm off doing something else. And I'm yeah. like, oh, okay, I've got to write that down real quick. Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to get it. Um, mm. But that, that's just the reality of it. You know, when you're not focusing on it, the subconscious will go, hey, how about this? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's just kind of it bouncing around in your in your subconscious, just that computer, just in the background processing it, and eventually it'll pop out a new idea. Yeah, yeah I went I went to Tannen's camp for for yeah. one year, and uh, and I did have that feeling. Although it was an incredible experience, it was just amazing getting to see all of these these magicians that that I had you know seen their work before online and everything, but getting to actually talk with them and everything and meet them was incredible. But that was one thing was it was a certain level yeah. of. Uh, of fatigue almost where you're just it's this constant barrage of magic with no yeah. break from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep and and it's the best it's so excuse me it's the best it's so exciting but uh but yeah it was like i remember joshua j was giving uh, a talk for for uh, the close-up class and then midway through, I was like, I have no idea anything that he just talked about. And I know I was paying attention, but none of it sank in at all. I don't remember yeah. what the last trick was. It's just been constant magic. <laughs> yeah. That's so, yeah. Yeah. And now, now cut to like an adult convention where it's the same thing, only we're drinking. So that's yeah. Yeah, exactly. you know, the, yeah. the additional thing that you got to look forward to. Exactly. <laughs> So Steve, uh, every episode we like to do a couple couple different things that we do okay. every episode. So, uh, yeah, please. We want to start with the, the twenty. I think twenty is. I think twenty is a, is a safe one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We can. Yeah. Twenty is good. Let's yeah, bring yeah, it into the loop just lightly to start. So yeah, let's yeah bring in like, bring just like yeah yeah. So we, we, I think it's time for twenty questions. Oh, so, okay. All right, so uh, let's get into this. And now I'm going to also pull up a uh, a bit of a, a timer. So Steve, Here, we're gonna ask you 20 questions. Uh, we want you right. to answer like as quickly as possible. We want to try to make it through the 20 questions in two minutes. Uh, and okay. first thing that comes to your mind, boom, throw it out there. Yeah. But we want the viewers to get to know you a little better, but just common, easy, quick questions. So. Yeah. This is so we, yes. so, so yeah, we want to see how many questions right. you can get through. How yeah. many questions you can get through in two okay. minutes. So uh, you have the list, Ryan, up, ready? Go. Got it. Yep. Okay. Uh, do you want you want to go first? Sure. sure. I'll go first. All right. Ready. And yeah. three, two, one, go. Favorite color? Uh, purple. Biggest pet peeve? Uh, biggest pet peeve is being dismissed. Dismissive people, people who dismiss you. Where did you grow up? Uh, South End on Sea in England. What always makes you laugh? Uh, Mr. Bean, uh, uh, anything Robin Williams does. Uh, secret talent. S secret talent. Um, I don't, don't have any secret talents. I can I can <laughs> sing badly in almost any key. <laughs> what, what, what was the first time you ever saw a magic trick? Uh, my my uncle David showed me uh, showed me this trick uh, when I was about six. He would do this, mm. and he would pull it out from somewhere else. That was the first thing I ever saw. Mm. Yeah. Hey, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Uh, flying. 
What is your dream acting role? Uh, anything with Anthony Hopkins. Uh, most cherished memory? My uh, daughter being born. What is your favorite food? Uh, anything sweet, probably Napoleon. Favorite movie? A favorite movie uh, would be, uh, oh, and Justice for All. Favorite pizza topping? Mushrooms. Interesting. Uh, favorite magician? Darren Brown. If you won the lottery, what's the first thing you'd buy? Uh, I, I, the first thing I would do is I would make sure my kid, kids had the best scholarship uh, to university that they could have. Mm. Yeah. And there is our two minutes. I so, think the next question was so great. I just want to ask yeah, it. Anyway. Yeah, you should ask that one, especially yeah. for Steve. Uh, what's your most highly recommended magic product or book? I think the Paul magic Daniels. Magic on the go. Uh, That's not even an says. answer, Steve. Come on. Magic on the go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you meant aside from the obvious. Uh, aside from yeah, the aside obvious. Yeah. Just, uh, throw cool. that back up uh, again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Steve Valentine slash magic. Um, yeah, yeah. But I do think the Paul Daniels Bravura set is uh, there's so much gold in, in those poor DVD discs. It's worth getting. That's my opinion. Nice. Well, we made it through. Uh, Can I just say that you guys are super, you guys are incredibly slow at asking questions. That was so unfair. Oh, so there's a, there's, like, a there's a delay. There's a delay. So every time we say something, right. there's a few okay. seconds before yeah. before you hear it. Yeah, because yeah, because a couple of times I was like, I okay, asked the sorry. question. It's the, delay. it's the delay. All right. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I asked the question. Why is Steve not answering? You were like, it felt like you were delaying before you answered the question. And, and I realized, oh, yeah, there's a little delay. Still. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so we have we have a few comments I just wanted to uh, to what, bring what up. This? So yeah. so we had uh, so Mike just sure. said your magic castle lecture rocks. Oh, thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you. It was the first lecture I ever did. That was so much fun. And uh, and Franco just said Steve Valentine greatness. Hello, Franco. Thank you for jumping in, Franco. And uh, this person who has a very strange name said, uh, do you think there is any advancement that can be done to Tom Mollica's uh, cigarette routine? Um, I mean, what any advancement? Routine? I mean, I think the, the only advancement would be to try and find a way of doing it without cigarettes. But I think his routine, you know, because it's just so, there's just so many things that, that, are, that are just dangerous about doing the trick. But yeah. I think Tom, I think what Tom Mollica performed was just perfection. You can't, you watch his Tom Foolery show, you know, which we have on mm. DVD, thank God. Um, you just realize that everything was just so, and there's a guy who performed it in his entire body. His, his whole persona mm. was performing, not, not just the trick, you know. Um, mm. He's definitely one of the greats. Yeah, I remember watching his routine being like, I don't ever, ever want to try anything like that. Like, it's so insane. Right? Right, it's just nuts from top to bottom. Is that the ultimate thing? Is to work on a routine that no, you know, no one's going to rip off. That's it. You know, you Mm -hmm. just you you just know it. I think I think Steve Cohen he he closes his show with the with the kettle, right? You know, with the kettle pouring out the different Mm -hmm. drinks. That trick is such a pain in the ass to set up and to prepare every night. No magicians are going to do it, right? If you look at Mm -hmm. look at the classics of magic, they're classics because. They, to- they don't require any setup because magicians, we are inherently lazy. So a uh, zombie ball, dancing cane, cups and balls, egg bag, <laughs> linking rings. There's no setup. You throw them in the bag, you go out and, and you, you do it, right? Kettle? So, no, no, no. I do a trick uh, that's like, uh, it's not like Steve's, it's, it's different, uh, where I use cans of pop. Uh, and I have the audience members drink the cans of pop and, they, and then I'm able to tell them what they're drinking because I do mentalism. Uh, and so I'm blindfolded and stuff. I'm telling them Sweet. what they drink. And then in the end, I say, uh, what if I not only manipulated your taste buds, but the minds of everybody in the audience? We all cracked the cans of pop together right at the start. You drank them all. You tasted and verified each one. Uh, but this is the crazy part. You were yeah. only drinking water. And I dumped the cans out and every can was filled with water. And then I give it out to the audience members and they can drink it and taste that it's water. But oh, that brilliant. trick, like yeah. I did it on Fool Us. And so I had to set up a bunch of different uh, uh, runs of it. And it was like six hours of setup. 
like it's easily like an hour or two just right. for that one effect and yeah. so people are always like oh why don't you do that at every show i'm like ah, because it's yeah in the ass to i was going to do I was going to do in the uh, in the one man show at one point. I was going to do um, a rendition of the old coffee trick, which is a. Um, I was going to have like this thing go. Whoop! Tea time! Tea time! Sorry, you've got to stop the show. Time for tea. Being British, go over to the corner, have my little table, have it, and there's a little creamer. There's a, a coffee pot and um, a sugar basin. And the trick goes back to the early 1900s. I think it's even in Hoffman's Modern Magic. But basically. You put the sugar in the, you put the, uh, let's see, you pour the milk in the coffee. No, it's empty, right? They're all empty. They're empty. <laughs> Everything's empty. You put a flat wall in each one. You go push, push, push. And now you pour out coffee and milk and sugar. And then you hand out cups of coffee to everybody in the audience. And mm -hmm. I had this whole thing about how Americans have no idea how to make tea. So let's just make coffee. Um, and uh, it was, I love the routine, but the setup was such a pain in the butt because I have to yeah. clean everything and wash everything and then get the coffee and keep it hot because it's steaming when it comes out. And it's just like as much, it'd be good for a TV special, but no, yeah, I couldn't, I'd take it out of the shop. Oh yeah. Well, that was a bit, like, even when I was traveling, I'd have to go find a convenience store, rely that they're going to have the certain brands of pop and stuff and, and then take them back and then find a right. bathroom or something where I can just make a massive mess uh, and stuff. So like, yeah. You know, because when I'm done, there's pop all over the mirrors and everything else. And I'm just like, oh, this is such a pain. So hope nobody walks in while you're doing it and thinks you're a I have one like, person white in the yeah. bathroom here with yeah. like stuff everywhere. I had one person one time walk in, uh, and like I I was at this uh place, this building, and I went to like the furthest bathroom in the building that I could. I was like, no one is gonna come in here, and I'm like making all the prop and stuff and then someone walks in i'm like oh hello <laughs> i'm like this is not part of the show you will not see this don't worry like have a good night no. <laughs> that person came on one of my shows recently uh like one of my virtual shows and was like hey i was the guy that walked into the bathroom and i was like that was like 10 years ago it was crazy oh, so. it's probably been a good dinner time story for him that's yeah, probably yeah, bought exactly. him a few dinners. It's like, let me yeah. tell you what this guy did, you know? Exactly. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. He was I'd like to the inside scoop. Yeah. That story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. His magic comes from the pants? bathroom. Let me tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he fills it full of piss. It's not yeah. water. That's how we <laughs> it's not water. Yeah. Uh, he, he drinks water uh, only for three days straight so that he can piss in all of the cans. So, yeah, so, yeah. Do you know there's a funny your routine sounds uh, reminds me of a trick again this is because uh, I, I've read so much but Charles Waller was this Australian magician in the early 20s and 30s who wrote four or five amazing books on completely original magic and one of them is a perfume thing where somebody uh, all these different perfumes and I think he can control what they smell what the, they think that they're smelling whether it's rose water or back in the days when people really knew what you know rose what water all these like. different kind of perfumes were mm. that's yeah. fascinating yeah yeah, yeah, so there's kind of a <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. dior yeah. sauvage <laughs> it's one million yeah, yeah. yeah. johnny depp, <laughs> johnny depp. <laughs> johnny, johnny depp. <laughs> it smells like johnny depp but it's just water <laughs> from from the caribbean <laughs> Smells like Johnny Depp before the court case. Wait, no. Yeah. Sheesh. Yeah. Yeah. I knew that was coming. Uh, um, if anybody in the chat has any questions that you'd like to ask Steve, we can we can also uh, bring them yeah, up. Uh, feel Kristen free. left a comment just saying that you are such a master mentor in magic, and they love how you cover all angles of magic. Um, well, uh, hi, you're, Chris, you're yeah, putting out 120 you, different of, uh, downloads on Card to Pocket. <laughs> That's every yeah. angle possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, 30 of those were just methods of palming from a packet of cards, you know, because mm. uh, you can't palm. There's, there's different techniques with a packet than there is with a deck. And you're also standing up and you're here, right, as opposed to yeah so it's, uh, the whole all the techniques were, were were different and so i kind of even came up with some of my own uh methods for that yeah ask away guys anything you want to know within reason yeah. <laughs> within reason within reason happy to ask if we put did i put everyone to sleep maybe i did so steve while we're waiting for some questions to come in there let me ask you because 
I mean, you're you're in LA, and uh, you know, I yeah. hit you up. Uh, it was a few months back, uh, and uh, we talked about Illusionarium and stuff. And yeah, and you were like, "Hey, we got to meet up for lunch or something, and and go and see it." And I was like, "Whoa, you're in Toronto all of a sudden." why the move uh from la you know i know you're like a steadfast at the castle and stuff why yeah. why uh why Toronto? yeah mainly legal reasons oh uh, well it's yeah <laughs> no yeah. i uh we uh running away wife's, um yeah my, 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 my wife grew up here in toronto and uh, you know we've got two little kids and she wanted to raise them near family near near their cousins and near the grandparents and uh, and as an actor there's still a lot of stuff that i can i can do out here uh, but what yeah, ended definitely. up happening was we still came out here but i i still have to fly back to la to work you know i just did a yeah. bunch of episodes of mom and i was flying back and forth and just kind of doing those but it's uh yeah, in 30 Toronto, years in la you'd so be the, it's definitely you would be the shock. biggest actor in all of toronto uh because like <laughs> <laughs> you know canadian acting i wish i that. wish everyone would feel that way but yeah i yeah. wish people would feel that way i do find no, myself I... uh, like kind of uh again my canadian canadian accent is is like coming over a little bit right you know what i mean <laughs> so I, I gotta be real careful about that right because uh i find myself uh, kind of going there someone logged on last week and was watching the my episode valentine and... lost his english accent completely yeah Halfway through the episode, they were like, Ryan is from Southern Ontario, isn't he? <laughs> I was like, Yeah, and it was someone from the Twitch chat. So it was definitely not someone familiar with it, with you know the previous episodes. And yeah, uh, yeah, they jumped in there like this guy, yeah. Southern Ontario. Yeah. yeah, I hear it. Like nailed it. I was like, Yep, hundred percent. Accents are <laughs> accents are such a, an interesting thing. You mm. you know, we don't think our voices are uh, as distinctive as they are. You know mm. what I mean? It's like I did a bunch of video games back in the day and, and, and I'll be out and about and someone will be like, I'll say something and someone will turn to me and go, Alistair, you know, which is this character that I did on Dragon Age. And I'll be like, they'll be like, Alistair. And I'm like, yeah, I played Alistair just from the voice. Just wow. it's, it's the craziest thing. It's so uh, distinctive. We have, so, uh, we have a question here yeah, and then, yeah, get into something. So, uh, so Christian was asking, me. yes, what, what is your favorite show you did in your entire career thus far? So your favorite, sh a show that you've performed. Favorite show. I had a show once at the, I mean, there are, I think the show that I was telling you about with the woman up on stage, up about that particular night was a pretty rocking night because also I was doing my card act later on to camera and we had two real characters up. But um, uh, I remember this one night back in the, I would like to say back in the old days of the castle, uh, back in the early 90s, back when uh, <laughs> Di Vernon was alive, um, <laughs> we uh, used to used to be able to go into the close up room and you could pack it out with like 60 people so that you could line up all the way around the back. It was completely, complete fire hazard. And um, but the room rocked and if you got it right the energy in that room got so hot so sweaty people would pass out you take them out to the bar <laughs> go back in continue the show it was like that and we would have so many nights like that where 60 people just rocking it and one night i had i think almost everybody it was russian right and crazy drunk russians and maybe the front row were were, were um you know castle members uh, some older uh, members have been members for a long time they like to watch their close-up magic very kind of gentle and you know and um and these guys were so loud but they were so funny and we had this banter going on the entire show i thoroughly enjoyed it and to the point where i mean i don't think i've got a moment every two or three lines out of my mouth they were yelling something out i come back we top it okay there's this and then it's He'd be a pain in the butt on the card trick and i get him on that and it would be like oh you know you get those reactions and that to me was not at all the show that i normally did but that that stays in my memory as one of the greatest experiences mm -hmm. of connecting with an audience and going on this roller coaster ride mm -hmm. and just surviving to the end and i remember the front row was so pissed they were like we're so sorry that you had to go through that you know <laughs> and, and, and i was like no that was memorable that was a beautiful show yeah that's amazing just that crazy energy just you know this like overwhelming yeah. you know especially in such a room that small with that many people you know and they're they're just all freaking out <laughs> that's amazing 
Yeah. I remember the hosts always loved to, back in those days, they always liked to put a pretty woman at the table because they thought it helped the magic show, which it doesn't because <laughs> you put a pretty girl at a table next for the close up room. Everyone's going to be looking at the girl. No one's looking at the show at yeah. all. Um, <laughs> and uh, I remember, and then they would often put uh, uh, drunk, very drunk uh, girls at the table. And I remember this one girl was so hammered uh, that she was barely able to sit in the chair like she would be sliding down the whole time and kind of falling out at the same time it was just it was very good and at one point and it was just i had to stop the show and just kind of get down on my knees and lean on the table and just like how are you how are you doing all right you having a good time yeah what's your name where are you from i just kind of have like five minute conversation with her just to check that she's you know conscious and she picked up the sponge ball and put it in her mouth and went, just like, <laughs> like that and i was like oh no. Now I know where I've seen you before. And then we just carried on with the show. But it was, it was, uh, God, you know, those are, those are the great experiences. Those are the great shows when nothing quite goes to plan. Yeah. yeah. Well, because well, those are the moments where you're really most at, present with the audience. You're, you know, you're actually there in the moment. You yeah. Know, you're not, you know, like what we were talking about before. Those you, things you have too, to be it. To... Those things too always make it into my future scripts. Like, as I'm like going yeah. back rewriting script and stuff, I'm like, oh, you know, this person said this. Like, I had a guy on stage uh, at the theater a couple of years ago, and I asked him to read out the number, and he read out like 102 million, but the number was 102 billion. Uh, and so I stopped him, and I'm like, uh, it's actually 102 billion. And he just stops. He looks at me and goes, oh shit, I was off by a trillion. <laughs> Uh, and the place <laughs> erupted, right? I'm like, Whoa. that's a great line, you know. And, and it became a line that I then put in every single show. I would ask the person to read the number, and no matter how they started reading it, I would stop them and be like, Oh, I'm so glad you're on the right track. We had a guy, Joe, last week, you know, Joe had 102 yeah. million, and he said, 100, I said it was 102 billion after he ran all the numbers. And Joe just said, shit, I'm off by a trillion, you know, and and every single time it gets a laugh and stuff. Um, because because I think the, the humor comes from a genuine moment. Uh, and the audience knows that you, they can tell whether this is one of those, you know, how magicians love to go. Here's a trick. I was in China a couple of weeks ago and I picked up this trick. And you're like, no, you weren't. Yeah, you, you went yeah. to China. But um, the best thing I ever learned when I was a, a, a teenager, I was at a place called Butlins, uh, which is a holiday camp kind of. Catskills kind of thing in England at the time, and I did it one season. And we had the resident comedian, so I watched him every night. And half of his show was repeating what people said in the audience. Like you come out and you say something, and then somebody would say something. He'd lead them into it, but he would say something. Somebody go, "What was that, love?" She said, "You can't get into my drawers looking like that, right?" <laughs> and that was most of his show. He and it was genuine. He was just genuinely acknowledging what was happening and yeah. kind of what everyone knows is happening and it was it was uh, it was the best material of his of his act mm. yeah. i that's probably some one of the parts yeah. that's the most going into it. Is, is when you get to react to people you know like i had a guy on stage and i borrowed his phone yeah. and i said oh snapchat uh and you know he's like a 30 year old guy i said i thought snapchat was just for like 12 year old girls uh just as a joke to like him right and he goes it is and me right. and i stopped oh. and i walked oh. off stage into the audience and i was like i'm gonna do the rest of the trick from over here now uh because that's <laughs> you know and the place erupted and like you that's know, brilliant but it was that's you know so a funny. moment that i'll never forget you can't just, yeah i mean that's Maybe you'll go, you know, to a guy the other night, it's only for 12 year old because yeah, well, I don't know if that would actually resonate. <laughs> I remember when we were when we were in DC on the on the Illusionist tour, uh, there was a guy, I got, I got this really fit buff guy out in the audience with a chocolate box. And one of the things I do is have him sign his his initials on the coin, but I've got these expanding, these exploding pens that become uh, yeah. pink pains. And it's always like, just, just put your initials on there <laughs> like this. And suddenly the thing is, the thing has expanded, you know, people always <laughs> jump and, and I, and I do it way too many times. 
if you do it so many times, it, it sucks. And then you do it one more time and it's hilarious because you just keep, you know, you just keep doing it. Yeah. So it turns out this this guy was Secret Service. So um, I didn't know. Well, I knew <laughs> right after because as soon as the, I went like this, he went, he literally went like almost <laughs> like in defense, like yeah. he was going to attack me, like instantly, like, you know, wow. and I'm like, what well, you know, wow, you're not like Secret Service, are you? I said, and I just seen at the White House that people were walking around with Secret Service on their jackets. You know, if you go there, you see that, and it says Secret Service, which I'm sorry, it's not very secret then, is it? If yeah, you're yeah, on Secret Service and you've secret got it So I was like, yeah. I was like, I could tell you're not Secret Service because it's not pasted all over your shirt. You know what I mean? <laughs> but this guy was, and every time I did it, I was like, literally, I looked at the audience. I'm like, I'm taking my life into my hands. But would you mind initialing the coin? And every single time, like his reflexes were. That's it was awesome. very scary, actually. It was mm -hmm. very scary. But so place, you, you did your show for a while at the, the Hollywood, right? At the uh, mm. how was that? I mean, how was that? What were those audiences like? Yeah, so I I, uh, I performed a lot at the the Montalban Theater. Uh, so the, yeah, the Ricardo Montalban Theater that was on uh, Vine Street in Hollywood, and that was that was an absolute blast. That was that was yeah. so much fun. Yeah, and uh, a few times when it was uh, when it was warm out, we did. Uh, I did a, a few shows that were on the, on the rooftop of the theater. And then the last show that I did was actually the last yeah. show that they had there before all of the lockdowns. I did that in, uh, it was on Valentine's day. And so it was right. It was inside of the theater. And that was my first time doing more of a, a, a full solo right. stage show. Um, but it was, it, it was so much fun. Yeah. It was, uh, it was an absolute blast. I think that it's, it's an interesting kind of, uh, audience because, um, I think that, I don't know. It's it's that kind of Hollywood artsy crowd, which I feel like I imagine is the kind of audiences that like Helder yeah. gets at his shows, where it's like they're looking for that. When you were talking about like whether we can get deep with things, or no, you were talking about more more blue and in getting kind of uh, you know edgy with with comedy and things. I think that you know yeah. it was an audience that's looking for kind of a like you know sophisticated theater show. Is you know so it, right. was, it was definitely you know doing that and and you know having it a bit more a bit more sappy a bit more emotional but uh you know it was it was definitely a lot a lot of fun and uh and i think maybe yeah, the, the title of the show if the poster on the show said you know fucking magic right <laughs> but with the letters yeah. kind of like start start out yeah that might tell an audience they're at least coming to see something edgy um <laughs> yeah it's a great theater yeah. did you do your show there when they after the remodel because they remodeled it I, I believe that mine was after the after the remodel because it was well I know that they've done additional remodeling since COVID in attempts to kind of convert the indoor space to be able to accommodate like a, a larger art gallery kind of thing but that was just you know to right. accommodate social distancing but um, yeah I, I was definitely after after the remodel and uh, yeah it was it was so here's a, here's a question it was so for you. beautiful being here's able to, have, to so put together a whole it's a beautiful, yeah it, Sorry. yeah it's a beautiful theater. But you are sitting, um, if I remember rightly, the stage is pretty high and the audience is quite low, right? So I did, uh, I did kind of a different approach to it. So um, what I did is rather, you're correct about that, that it is a rather high stage with, in relation to the audience. So rather than doing it that way, the name of the show was called Through a Magician's Eyes. So what happened was as the audience came right. in, they would come into the theater, into the audience, and then, you know, people might, they, they were, uh, uh, you know, drinks and there was sushi and different kind of things, you know, kind of concessions in the audience. And then people, you know, are just as they're yeah. beginning to kind of sit down and get in their seats, um, they're actually ushered uh, as uh, they're ushered through kind of the back of the theater and they go through and they end up coming on stage. And so I ended up performing with the curtain behind me and we had all seating that was on the stage. So they're seeing it from my perspective that they would see, you know, if I was performing. So that's the kind of through a magician's eyes, oh, that's you know, cool. element. So they, they got to see it from that perspective where they're kind of guided through the backstage and they see all of the rope and all of, you know, all of the curtain and everything and they're, they're brought in. And then, it, you know, it's great. this kind of intimate, a more intimate setting, you know, which uh, which made you know sense for many reasons for the material that I was doing, but also for uh, it, for making it easier to sell all those seats out, uh, you know, and not have to pack the whole the whole audience, but be able to selectively choose how big my audience is, you know, and have them all have the perfect yeah. angles for everything. So you know, it was it was more of a kind of intimate show that that made sense for the the Valentine's Day, um, you know, theme. So, but yeah, yeah that's, that, was, that was an absolute blast. That was so much fun. People are always stunned when they come on stage, uh, how bright the lights are and how little they can see, you know, when mm -hmm. you bring people yeah. up on stage and they're like, well, no, we bring kids up on stage 
they're, they're like they they're stunned that they can't see anybody that they're, they're just <laughs> So it's great yeah. that you give them that experience so they can get to see it. They get that full what experience. Cool yeah. Idea. And then every, everything dimmed down and stuff. And then oh, that was also really fun because then it was, I was able to have a show that was, you know, I'd say uh, similar to somewhere between the Peller and the Palace kind of size, you know, when it came to, right. to audience. Uh, but the fact that I had all of the, you know, the majority of all of the stage lighting and being able to kind of fully choreograph the show and all the lighting. And, and I had a lot of moments where it was, you know, yeah. I was talking about my journey starting in music and, and, uh, and then, you know, getting into magic after that. And, uh, and I had this kind of moment about, um, you know, about kind of returning back to your roots. And there's a moment where, um, you know, I had this it kind of uh, this signed card and I'm on, I, I had been playing guitar earlier in the show and looping that, and that became the background music yeah. for for that scene. And so I'm on the opposite side of the stage. I have this signed card, and then as I'm telling that story about returning to your roots, then um, you hear a strum, and the card that's in my hand uh, that they you know they see their signed card turns into a guitar pick, and then the you know a, a special then appears on the uh, the guitar that's over here, and you can see that you know in caught in the headstock of the guitar that you know the card has like just kind of is seemingly traveled over there, you know, and then being oh, able to, to walk over and stuff, and you using the full kind of theatrical lighting was was so much fun, and that was you know the first time that I've been able to have a, a show like that, and we definitely want to do more in the future when things reopen over there. Um, I, I I can't wait to be able to go back to that. It makes all the difference, doesn't it? To to mm. to have to have a um, a stage crew and to have lighting and sound and to be able to use all the all the theatrical tricks that you have to yeah. to uh, to emphasize the magic. You know, I yeah. The at the at the end, in, I appeared in the audience. In at Chocolate the end, when I was on the show, we opened up the curtain and then I I yeah. appeared in the in the audience and then we have a light appear on me. You know, in the in the audience seats. You know, so it was just kind of this fun <laughs> this fun way to end it and util utilizing the whole setting of the fact that everybody's on stage. So when the yeah. curtain raises, they get to see me over there. That's right. You tell them there's one big trap door that's about to open in the, in the stage. <laughs> about to go down. Get ready. Trap door. Brace yourself. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's brilliant. That's that's that sounds like I wish I got a chance to see it. I never got a chance, but I think I was out of there by then. But uh, I wish I got a chance to see then. your show. I, I've heard nothing but great things uh, about it. But uh, you know, every time it was it was fun. You know, I, I got to tell you, you know, it's always a work in progress. It was. Uh, uh, there's a lot of things I would change. Uh, about it and you know and streamlining it and I think the, the biggest um, uh, lesson for me was when I, I did the version of it at the castle and I had to kind of like I wanted to lock it down to like 40 minutes or just under 40 minutes or 45 minutes or whatever it was supposed to be at the palace you know so I did the whole palace show and so knocking down a two-hour show into uh, 40 minutes you have to kind of go what's it really about mm -hmm. and what is the what is the core what is the key to it and so doing that re I, I really understood the show better then than i'd ever done before so now if i was going to redo it we're talking about redoing the show again is i would build up from there and kind of you know it's all I, I for me i'm i'm never i'm a perfectionist so it's always it could always be better but um there's there's definitely things in there that i would want to change that i'm excited to do it it's that, part of uh, fun right like that was one of the questions kristen asked was if there was plans to bring back the show and then my question for you is because when I saw it, Dan was uh, Dan was the stage guy doing all the slides and everything else. And I remember yeah. him going, I remember talking to him after the show. And same thing, like you said, you guys didn't really have a run through. He was like, we had all these, you had all these slides, I think of like uh, destinations or something. And you were like, Dan's like, crazy. I never ran through any of that yeah. stuff before. So not we never got a we ran through we never got to run through the whole show once really kind of to speed i couldn't yeah. have, dan goldberg i could not have done the show without him he was you know chipper came in and directed it um chris philpott mm -hmm. was amazing and and dan came in and just was a trooper man he did so much like technically i mean i'd never done it took about jumping in i mean i'm an actor so i've done theater but i've never done a full live one man show before i've done cabaret 20 minutes 30 minutes maybe if you're lucky um back in the past but you, i hadn't done magic in 10 years something like that i just kind of got back into close-up as a hobby but so the idea of doing this uh theatrical kind of combination one man show narrative thing was i had no idea what i was doing no. and if it hadn't been for chipper who has done a lot of shows like that who was teaching me how to use 
because uh, I was a, a lot. Some of the some of the stuff I was using myself with the with the the button pressing the button in the pants, but that didn't always work. Yeah. So so that, you know, and then Dan, who just literally looked at the light, it was a tiny little theater, and there was this lighting board in the back and no instructions. And so Dan's like, "Oh, look up the instructions." The next day he comes in and he's got he's printed out the he's printed out the book, you know, and he's like, oh, yeah. "Okay," he teaches himself how to do the lighting <laughs> board, um, and then you know. But it was one of those things where the sound didn't work because uh, it was uh, what was in the walls of the theater. So the radio mic had to be replaced. I mean, it was, yeah, without Dan, I don't think we would ever have uh, been able to get through a, a, a couple of nights, let alone the run that we did. Yeah. How much do you feel the show Things evolved? Village, how, lo how, was, how long was the run? Because I imagine the show at the, at the final night was probably very different from the first night. It was. It was certainly slicker. But I remember that my final night, I some reason my voice started going halfway through i don't know why maybe it's because i knew it was coming to an end i think we did a couple of months of the show uh, there was something so by, i've got it on film literally by the end of it i'm like so ladies and gentlemen and i'm and i was so pissed <laughs> off that my was just laryngitis something happened to my voice I'm like what does this mean um it, it it evolved uh it tightened up and there were little things that i changed uh, and certainly the cues uh we tightened up the cues and um uh but then I, changed, I created a 90 minute version for Black Rabbit Rose, which was, uh, that again was an interesting experience. Uh, I liked doing the show, but I didn't really, I wasn't a huge fan of the venue for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that we had to deal with there. Um, one day I'll talk about it, but uh, I can't, I can't <laughs> talk about it. On, on well, the, we'll, on we'll, we'll continue the conversation <laughs> after the broadcast. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, you learn again. I think you learn. I think what's important about failing, sorry, what's important about failing, and we're talking about hamburgering, just to bring it all the way back to the beginning, is that uh, you're only going to learn uh, the real who you are on stage by failing and or by things just going wrong and you just kind of having to learn on your feet because you, you never know uh, when something goes right, you just don't know why. And but when something goes wrong, you can pretty much see very clearly what happened. Do you know the Do you know the famous uh, Laurence Olivier story about uh, the greatest performance of his career? And he's he's on stage doing Othello, and it's it's the, it's riveting, and it's so good that people are leaving the theater, calling, their, having their friends come uh, to see the show. They're like, you've got to come down and see this. This is this is unbelievable. So the theater is packed. This performance, it's like like 10 minutes standing ovation and at the end he goes you know, he leaves the stage everyone's clapping he just walks off and he slams his uh, dressing room door and, and, he, and you can hear him breaking things and he's angry and he won't come out finally one of the actors goes in and goes like larry larry that was the most incredible performance of your life and he said yes and i have no idea how i did it <laughs> right so mm. now the rest of his life he's trying to get that to back that. but mm. so we don't learn we don't learn anything from success, but we do learn, you know, from mistakes and, and mm. uh, yeah. I think that's so probably- I learned a lot. <laughs> to me, that <laughs> lot was, I my show. To me, I mean, we've talked about a lot of stuff, but that to me is the gold nugget right there for everybody watching right now. Uh, because I deal with so many young guys that, yeah. you know, obviously they see yourself or they see other people that are in the industry, uh, you know, charging lots of money to do shows yeah. and stuff, right? Uh, and they're starting out and they're like, well, I know a million tricks or all oh, my tricks that I'm doing are so good. Right. Uh, I should be charging what Steve charges or what I charge or what Blaze charges or something, you know, and and I'm like, well, no, because right. you haven't failed, you know, so many times yet, because that's truly when you know, like when you've bombed shows and, and people are those guys, whenever you tell them like, oh, I bombed a show today, they're like, yeah, no. No, you didn't bomb. Yeah, you don't bomb. And it's like, no, just sometimes you have a bad day or there's yeah. a bad audience member or something goes wrong, you know, and or you're just not it. on your game and, you know, yeah. and it happens. But those young guys that are getting in that are like, oh, I'm going to charge $5,000 a gig. And, and, and I always go, do you feel like what you're doing is worth 5000 you know? And, and they're like, yes, of course, of course. You know, and I'm like, well, yeah. how many times have you failed? Like, what's your most embarrassing story? You know, that's why I, I always ask, like, what, what's your worst story? I feel Can that's what they, 
I feel that's what they pay for. I think when you get paid for a gig, you're getting paid for your experience. You're getting yeah. paid for all the failures that you had 100%. to go through in order to get where you are right now. Mm. And, and, I, I um, told someone. And, and, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I, I continue. Oh, um, I told uh, someone like, you know, when I was like 17, dressing up as Spider-Man, doing birthday balloon or like balloon animals and doing magic all at the same time. When you have 10 stories like that, then, uh, you know, then you're starting to make some headway. You know, it's like I did yeah. like the worst shows, like, you know, in someone's basement uh, for your Uncle Jimmy for twenty five dollars and a, you know, and piece of pizza or whatever. And and then these guys are just like, oh, I'm just going to, you know, right to the top. And I'm like, no, it doesn't it doesn't yeah. work that way. But. And I don't know if it's it work that social way. media and stuff that's pushing them to to feel that way, or, but it. Uh, but I think like you it's said, kind of it's, the in, well, it's instant gratification. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a different thing. I mean, I you know, social media magic is another form of magic, and it's uh, it's not the magic that I grew up with, but it's the magic that is. Uh, it's just it's as as much an art form as any other, um, you know. And I think people that are against it, the same the kinds of people who back in the day. We're like, uh, you know, talkies will never take off, you know, mm -hmm. stick with silent movies. Yeah. You know, it's, like, it's just like Zoom shows will always be around, um, Instagram magic. Great thing about in magic on Instagram and to the camera is all those tricks that I remember buying in the 90s, 80s and 90s that sucked because their <laughs> angles were so bad. Yeah. All that magic is now usable, which is mm. an incredibly positive thing, yeah. you know? And so I can go mm. back into my trap, my, my, my old box of magic and go, oh, I can do that now because I can just go right there, right to camera and it happens. Mm. And this is fantastic, yeah. you know? Um, so yeah. it's a very positive thing, but unfortunately I, I would say what I've seen is that magic has become just uh, for a lot of people, just the trick, mm -hmm. right? Just like, mm -hmm. yeah. Like, uh, you know, for want of a, it's a crude term, but it's the money shot in a porno. It's just like, here you go. That's it. Right. I'm out of here. You know, I just, yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Yeah. I, and, and therefore that's why we have all that exposure online because uh, we put the emphasis on the trick and therefore the method and the puzzle that has to be solved as opposed to present it in a way where it doesn't matter what the method is, you know, in the yeah. end, it's just like, if you can just go out there and, and sell it and sell yourself while you're doing it. It's, it's, I think Absolutely. that uh, I mean there's space for it all. There's, there's a place for it all. I don't put any of it down. It's like cardistry. We did uh, uh, when I hosted the Magic Castle Awards, you know, and I was like, I'd love to do a bit, a cardistry bit, because there's a lot of the the older members like cardistry isn't magic. I'm like no one's saying cardistry is magic, but it's a beautiful art form, and we should acknowledge it. Like juggling, like we have jugglers at the castle, you know. Uh, so we ended up doing this. Um, did you did you see it, Blaze? What we were you part of it? Did you see it? I, I no, I was didn't gonna be see part it, of it. No, it, no, I didn't. I wish I did. Oh, we did. So, so me and Zabrecki. So I came up with this idea that we do the devil come. The uh, devil went down to Georgia, and uh, we get uh, Dan and Dave to come out and be the the devil and uh, Johnny, and then uh, it was uh, we changed the lyrics to be uh, about the cardistry. So they were, it was like, instead of playing the violin in this kind of classic song, uh, that they're, they're battling cardistry. And at the end, we had all these, all these kids came out and did right up to the front of the proscenium. And, and everyone, we're just standing there, everyone's doing cardistry to the music. And at the end of it, the cards go in the audience. And it was, oh, it was a, it was a great kind of, yeah, cardistry exists. <laughs> Let's acknowledge it. And it's a beautiful yeah. thing, you know? That sounds so awesome. I feel the same wow. way about about Instagram magic. Yeah. Yeah. When you were talking yeah. about Instagram magic, it, it made me think about um, somebody, I mean, he's doing less magic on Instagram nowadays, but uh, there's a guy, um, uh, Jack, uh, who actually I met because he was a Magic Castle Jr. at the same time as me. And he um, he blew up on Instagram and went from, his, his account was Magic Jack. And he went from having 12,000 followers on Instagram to over 200,000 in, you know, like eight months or something. It was crazy. He wow, just blew up exponentially. Fantastic. And uh, his lane was, you know, trying to be 
um, you know, almost like what you were talking about with with you know Bur Bo Burnham of what do, what do they expect? You know, going into it for him, his thing was like I want to be posted on World Star and be posted by all these hip hop pages and be kind of you know drinking or whatever and you know have that kind of be the image for you know what was drawing people in right. more of the you know the kind of you know early twenties you know demographic. And uh, what was so interesting sure. was when he brought me in to, to um, consult with, uh, with him on a couple of videos when he had this, this brand deal. And he said to me, and there was a moment of like this like total honesty where he was like, you know, man, I feel like every day that I'm making social media magic my career and every day that I'm working on posting another video for social media, I'm getting worse at magic because I use all of the money that I get for these brand deals so that I can buy another 10 tricks so that I can do another 10 videos and then I have to throw them out and move on to the next thing so that right. I can continually post new different content. And he's like, I haven't been able to practice in so long. Yeah. He's like, I wish that I could just go back to what it was where I could just practice and be passionate about magic instead of needing to just kind of milk it to keep doing more content. And it was like, wow, this is like this real moment of like, you know, yeah. you know, honesty. And it was uh, it was pretty crazy, like, you know, that even though he's he's, you know, being seen as, you know, as one of these, you know, really well known, you know, one of the bigger social media magicians. He feels as though he's getting worse at magic the more that he does it because he's not able to really focus on being a magician. Yeah, yeah. So it, and and what an interesting and you you hear this about uh, content creators all the time they get burnout right because they're continually having to having to create. So it, it's an interesting kind of. I remember when I was doing I was doing one television series and this this, this guy, a friend of mine was like, well, you know, that's good that you're working, you know, and I was like, yeah, but. I know I'm not the king with the the writing is like uh, you know, and I want to have more scenes. I want to do this and I do that. And he goes, well, at least you're working. I'm like, yeah, but at least you're working. When you get to the who you are as an artist, um, at least you're working never cuts it. So, so you know, yeah. your friend is like, at least he's working. At least he's a success. Yes, but who he is inside is mm. is is kind of struggling for air. Um, I hope he finds a I hope he finds a balance. You know, maybe does the greatest hits of and does like a live tour you know, mm. or something like that, where he can kind of go back to the material that he's done, like choose the best mm. stuff and kind of yeah. wedge it into a, into a live tour or something. That'd be great to see. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think and it's that's really one thing that you see is that. many, I mean, many of the people doing social media magic don't, don't usually have a, a show because they're not able to be able to focus on that because they're yeah. continually focused on, on the next yeah. video. Yeah, I know. And a lot of people thought that, you know, you take someone like David Blaine, a lot of people thought, oh, he was not going to be able to do a live show. He's all, you know, cameras. And my God, he proved everybody wrong. You know, that mm -hmm. show was uh, was killer. And and he mm -hmm. was amazing in the way yeah. he connected. Talk about somebody connecting honestly with a crowd. Like, mm -hmm. that that just blew everybody away. That was, that was <laughs> super impressive. Call back to the start of the show or like earlier is he's doing stuff that no one else wants to do like <laughs> you know right who wants yeah. to try to regurgitate uh, i was gonna sew my lips together but yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. you that's, know that that's and that's fantastic i seen the show a couple times uh and and met up with david after the show and stuff and watching him do that still makes me queasy like i'm like when why are you why are you doing this why are you putting sewing thread through your mouth like that there's no way that that feel like I don't care if you have permanent holes there that cannot feel comfortable to be doing night in yeah, and yes. night out. But, I don't I don't think know. comfort is is his goal. I think mm -hmm. uh, no. I don't, one I moment don't think that he's really struck me. Yeah. One yeah. thing that one moment that really struck me seeing his show at, at the Dolby was when after you know after the intermission you know the second half with the breath hold and everything and then you know him coming out yes. of the water. And yes. the moment where he sits down at the edge of the stage and just recovers after that yeah. breath hold and he's shaking and everything. And I, I saw a moment so that real. I had never seen in any magic show was that yeah. people in the audience, uh, just a few people just sporadically started standing up while he's just there recovering at the, at the edge of the stage. And they just said, thank you. You know, and they and they just said it with such sincerity of, you know, just thank yeah. you for, you know, for doing this, for doing this for our entertainment, for putting yourself on the line like this, because it really felt as though, you know, like you're you're risking a lot 
and they see the they see yeah. like this is not a trick you know as he's you know huddled over like he didn't need to show that part if it was a trick he would get out and be triumphant you know but it was the humanity that, of it that, that, that was, made that was the react. most yeah the humanity the most powerful honest vulnerable thing i mean how many times do we see a magician get on stage and go, I'm going to risk my life. I'm going to be chained to this and this is going to happen. That's going to happen here. And these are going to shoot here. And I'm going to, I don't get out of the way in time. And then the firebolt goes and the thing explodes. And you know, you just, as an audience, you know, that there's no real danger, you know, yeah. and the audience can sense it. And that was what was great with David was that not only was it, was what he was doing real, but he allowed everyone to Experience soak it in. That. Yeah. yeah, well, it's like it's like you and see those be, guys doing the extravagant yeah. escapes, and it's like, well, I know he survived the matinee show, so yeah. I feel yeah. like, I feel yeah, like exactly. he's good. Here's, here's, uh, that's, here's uh, that crazy is, thing. do you know what? That is so true. Here's the crazy thing. Yeah. So I was, uh, I went backstage yeah, after David's show, and he came to Canada very early on in the show, uh, when he first did his first run of it, yeah. and uh, so we were chatting backstage, yeah. and he said. They had just started doing the Q&A after uh, because originally he they took him out of the water tank after, you know, he had 10 minutes and he comes out of the water tank and he's shaking and stuff and they take him off. And that was the end of the show. Uh, but audiences yeah. were leaving going like, is he OK? Did he is he going to die? Like what's happening? And yeah. so people were just leaving. And so they had to add that in where he would sit at the front of the stage uh, and recover there just so that the audience knew, like, he's OK. Uh, because originally the first few uh, runs or first few uh, yeah. shows yeah. they did, they just off stage and boom, thank you for coming and watching David Blaine tonight. And everybody was like, is he going to the hospital? Yeah. Like, is you know, what's happening and stuff? And he couldn't come back out. So then... And that's when they started doing the Q and A and stuff like that, uh, which, uh, and then they did where they. And you know, it's interesting, right? Because it goes against it goes against everything. Oh, the kid, but yeah, but it goes against everything that we think of theatrically. We think of, of big spectacular finales. We think of uh, uh, those moments which we've seen before. I mean, it's not new. The idea of sitting on the front of the stage and you know, Sammy Davis Jr. used to sit on the front of the stage and talk to his audience. It's a great way of stopping and being intimate with an audience and we've seen it a million times and he took it david took it and made it and gave it a new twist and gave it a new and he, he was sitting because he had to sit he was sitting because he needed to get his breath you yeah. know so he wanted to share this with with the crowd and then the bit with the kid he just took it to a whole nother level and i think that was just such a beautiful as a, just a you know, beautiful thing to see and to share that with the crowd uh, so, I, I'm interested to know if, he, if he's ever going to do something like that again and what's, what, what would be next. But yeah, you know, yeah. I'm good with my doubles and my ambitious card. And that's all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That. yeah. No ice picks or anything like that in your future, uh, Steve? No. Any what? what any no what? ice picks what, in sorry? the future? Or... No. no. Do you know, I did do, uh, I did an episode of House and I, and they were doing the, uh, uh, my character dies in the water torture style. And, um, and so they said to me, they said, do you, uh, do you want to do the water torture? So we've got a stunt man, you know? And I was like, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. It's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. And uh, they brought the stunt man in anyway. And then they shot it. It was the last day of the shoot. So they got everything else. So I'm like, we're doing this on the last day in case, you know, it goes wrong. We've got everything else. In the <laughs> it's, it's kind of technically why they were doing it. Yeah. Um, and I'd been rehearsing all week in a, in a wetsuit and, uh, uh, we had a stunt man because there was a couple of other shots they wanted to do where from the distance where he's just like hanging there a lot. I never, I'd never done the water tank. So I was rehearsing in the, in the wetsuit and I, as soon as I went upside down, uh, I don't know if you've ever done anything like this. The bud goes to your head, which you don't, I mean, you, that's just horrific. And then you hit the water and as you go down head first into the water, I don't know what Houdini was thinking, but the pressure, like you feel all that, the touch of water on your head so you're trying to hold your breath and you're upside down and the and it's the worst experience you've ever you've ever had mm -hmm. we had a signal to get me out if, if i started taking in water we had a little um oxygen thing in the bottom but every time i tried to put that in i'd swallow water because i was it was the it was awful yeah. they brought me out really quick at one point we had a panic moment and i banged bang, i banged my head on the back of the tank and it was uh oh god uh, and I swore uh, after doing that, I swore I would never do anything like that again. <laughs> it, it, next wow. time they say, we've got a stun man, I'm going to be like, great, I'll be much better. 
That's yeah, it. exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, that, yeah, that was brutal. That was brutal. So, Steve, we've been having some pretty serious yeah. conversation, uh, you know, with Blaine, water torture cell. I think it's I think, time we come up boy, for air. Yeah. yeah, I think it's time we come up for air. With what we would call probably the most serious time in our entire show. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it time? Yeah, I think it's, yeah, I think it's the, well, you know, I think it's happening, you know, whether we like it or not. Uh, Lasagna! Lasagna! What's your favorite genre of lasagna? Meat. Lasagna. Veggie. Lasagna. Plain. Lasagna. Saucy! Lasagna! What's your favorite genre of lasagna? So, genre, what was that? <laughs> by the way, favorite with the you. Thank you for using, thank you for using the you in favorite. That <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Canadian. What, the hell? what was that? So Steve, we have to ask, what's your favorite genre of lasagna? <laughs> <laughs> My favorite genre. Uh, my favorite genre of lasagna is triangular. That's my favorite. Triangular. Uh, triangular that, lasagna. That's a unique <laughs> answer. Yeah, yeah. Triangular. We've got to triangular. add that one to the song. Yeah, yeah. that's going in the song. I'm going to have to add that in the triangular. song. Triangular. <laughs> favorite genre of lasagna. I don't know like this lasagna genre. Uh, <laughs> that, old, that old question again. Yes, the old yeah. lasagna question again. You've never been asked that. That's interesting. Original. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. You know, here's here's another uh, you know uh, as we get into right. the the IQ test here, right. as we get into the IQ test here, you know, oh, we want God, to understand how you, how you think, you know. So if you were to bake a lasagna, and if you were to bake a second yes. one, if you stack the second yes. atop the first, how many lasagnas right. do you have now? Well, technically, you have one really thick lasagna. Mm. I, I like your I like but your I'm perspective. Yeah, I yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. Now, uh, is there a right and wrong answer to that? Is I don't know how many uh, layers I mean, of well, lasagna. Uh, well, what if what if the first two starting lasagnas are different genres? <laughs> what if what if one is square cut and one is ah, triangular? Yes, well, right. <laughs> then do you have, uh, one then you have a piece of art. Man, we right? haven't even so thought about just, shapes. Yes, you have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he just added a whole new creative perspective to this. It's gone. Is the, is the shapes. Wire now. It's all about texture, bitch. Come on. It's all about, te <laughs> it's all about uh, texture, yeah. bitch. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I, I was waiting for like straight up mushroom lasagna or something, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. As his favorite pizza topping, but yeah, no, triangular. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I could, I could oh, play yeah. this game. I'm, I can no, play this is great. Well, no, this is the this yeah. is the serious section. This is the serious okay, section. Okay, all right, yeah. So, okay, go uh, ahead. Steve, question number yes. one: How do you put a giraffe in a refrigerator? Uh. <laughs> How do you put a giraffe in a refrigerator? Um, yeah, uh, you jet head. I think head first would be the answer to that one. Uh, yeah, mm. yeah. That would, okay. And All right. Probably, yeah, that's probably good. dead. I would imagine head first and probably <laughs> dead. Oh, that got that got really that serious. got yeah. pretty morbid pretty quick. Yeah. Head first and dead. Yeah, yeah. I got right. Yeah, pretty, yeah, yeah. Big, big ass refrigerator, of course. Yeah. <laughs> although, although I, I do agree that head first would probably be would be accurate. Um, be accurate. We, it is a multi step answer, just to yeah, give you, you know, you a can... sense of it. Yeah. So the 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 correct answer that's given okay, on this yeah. quiz is you open the refrigerator, put the giraffe in, and close the door. This tests whether you're doing simple things in a complicated way, such as requiring a dead giraffe. Um, <laughs> right. So let's uh let's get into the But you're not gonna get it in there if it's alive, my friend. I don't care how hot it is outside. Yeah. So uh how do you how do you put an elephant into a refrigerator? Uh yeah, you probably open the door, tell them the tell them the giraffes in there with a the candy. That will uh <laughs> they don't. Oh well you probably can't because if the giraffe is already in there, there's not gonna be room for the elephant. But I wouldn't but yeah, I would just say the same thing. I'd say you open the door and uh, yeah, and tell him to get his ass inside. Yeah. So, uh, well, you you were on the right track with saying that the the giraffe is is also in there. Um, and as a result, the wrong yeah. answer is open the refrigerator, put the elephant in, close the door. Uh, the uh, the correct answer is like that you open the refrigerator, take it out the giraffe, put the elephant in, and close. <laughs> take out the giraffe. You gotta take that out the giraffe. Assumes, that assumes a certain size of, but that that assumes a certain size of refrigerator. 
uh, which we have not discussed in this. We have uh, not factored. Is it triangular or rectangular? Yeah, it's just yeah. triangular. We have not factored. Yeah, I've not. Yeah. It, it, Almost anything. Yeah. How tall is this? Is, yeah. And why do you have a refrigerator in the jungle? This is another question that you're going to ask yourself. <laughs> yeah. But so continue, considering yeah, we're in this, go, go, considering getting, we're in the jungle, the yeah. this logic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, Ryan, if you'd like to take this one away. Uh, asking yeah. people to do magic logic questions, this is smart. All right, okay. So, Go the ahead. Lion King What's is next? hosting an animal conference. All the animals except one uh, come. Uh, which animal does not attend? Say that again, sorry. So, the Lion King is hosting an animal conference. All the animals yes. attend except one. Uh, which animal does not attend? Uh his father because he died during the oh, 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 man there's a, there's a, a well, I, I didn't write it's the movie you guys. Oh, this, <laughs> this british melodrama this. that we're embarking on now yeah. <laughs> we've got a dead giraffe and now come on <laughs> the father's gone death is death is funny but you're talking about making things easier death is easier uh uh death is uh, yeah but no it was the, more what, efficient is there a correct answer to that because there is a yeah the correct answer uh, there is a correct the answer. father dies during the movie what is that? um no the uh, the correct Clearly answer no was one. uh the elephant he's still within the refrigerator this tests your memory uh <laughs> 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 we'll move on to the final question uh oh, this is the same this is the same jungle. Okay. This is, this, <laughs> this is a, uh, there's a river you must cross, but it is inhabited by crocodiles. How do you solve the problem? Oh, you broke up there. It's inhabited. Uh, is it, repeat that. You, I lost you. There is a river you must cross, but it is inhabited by crocodiles. How do you solve the problem? Yes. Don't cross the river. But you must cross it. You have to. Hence, cross. hence the problem here is that you must. <laughs> All right. So what you do is uh, you go back to the refrigerator, you open it out, you take out the giraffe, you, you climb up onto the neck, and then you have the giraffe walk across, lean forward, and you get off the head of the giraffe on the other side, or you go on the elephant. Either get them out of the bloody refrigerator, or you put the refrigerator, you get inside the refrigerator, for, uh, push it inside the water, or something like that. So, so you know, Indiana Ooh, Jones that shit. Uh, all yeah. the way across. That uh, is a yeah, very yeah, good creative right. answer. There's a good. There's a good reason we do this. There is a good reason we do this. Um, however, comma. <laughs> there is however, no comma. Okay. Yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah. The only thing is, uh, yes. you know, I feel as though when we talked about overcomplicating simple solutions, the answer is that you swim across all of the crocodiles. If we remember, are attending the animal conference. So. <laughs> 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 so, uh, you see that's not fair because you said that they were in the water they inhabit the water inhabit but the water. you know but they're you know you can go away on a business trip famous for, here's a yeah, the, 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 magic yeah, line being packed with crocodiles yeah okay they're on a business trip should, should you tell is, that's the right. so i failed badly uh you failed badly question. but that's okay steve yeah please that's fine you want I'm to show okay him the uh, the stat on how many people fail yeah, so uh, here if we go. Here, oh, wait, let me just go to uh, this here. Let's uh, let's go here. It says uh, so. Apparently, many preschoolers got several answers correct, but um, according to a study by Anderson Consulting, around ninety percent of the professionals they tested got all answers wrong. And uh, <laughs> so it's uh, you know, so don't feel bad at all. We also have not had anybody so it. far get all of them right. Yeah. I think that yours were some of, no we must admit, no, the most creative about. and entertaining answers. Though, definitely, you know? definitely. And I, you know, I would say that getting in the refrigerator or climbing tragic, across the lot of tragedy. giraffes. <laughs> tragic, yes. Climbing into it and like boating oh, across. Yeah. Is, that's <laughs> that was really good. Just paddling them in your the, fridge. Let them eat the giraffe, you know? Let them eat the giraffe. Yeah. It's fine. You know, though, you I, I had some a... of these questions during a job interview one time because I was like, uh, I knew this person was going to have to be answering phones uh, and talking to people. Right randomly throughout the day and so uh i was like hey i just want to ask you like uh how do you put a, a draft in a refrigerator and they're like what and the other people doing the interview were like ryan you can't ask that that's a stupid question and i was like no i want to see this person think on their feet like that and if they just use common sense you, you just open the refrigerator put it in close the door that's, that's all you fun. can do you know 
people get a little bit too complicated to chop it up and everything else. Like that came up last yeah. week was chop it up in, in like Yeah, um, that came up last was chop up the giraffe and we we're like, whoa, whoa, yeah. that's even darker than Steve. <laughs> and I'm I was it. I'm dark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, how about eat the ref- eat the dri- oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> and then climb inside of the refrigerator. Anyway, yeah, no, well, did I did the no. person did the person get the job? That's the question, Ryan. Did they get it right? Did, were they just completely flummoxed? Oh, so we had like four four or five interviews that we did, and uh, and so one did, uh, and she was like the only one that just answered it. The other one that uh, everybody thought this one lady was going to get the job. And she just looked at me like, you're a complete idiot. And I was like, so you can't answer my question in a, in an interview for a position that you want. You can't answer my question because you don't want to, you want to think too analytical about everything. And I was like, right. I, yeah, I don't think you're going to get the job. <laughs> so but it's, it's, a, it's a test you know, to see if someone's going to be a good sport and if they're going yeah. to, you know, creatively, I, I love the I answers think. that Steve gave, regardless of what the, these guys I, says the answers are. But get this though, uh, you know, I always used to use when I was single uh, and my single days between marriages, I, I always used to use magic at a dinner, um, not to impress the girl, but to see how, how she would react to it because how people react to magic tells you a lot about who they are, right? Mm. You know, are they defensive? Or do they think you're trying to make them look stupid? Are they laughing? Are they enjoying it? Are they along for the ride? It tells you a lot. Uh, and I think this is a great dating quiz. I think that when you go on a date with someone, you can say, yeah. hey, hey, I heard this in the day. How'd you put an elephant in a, in a yeah. and do the whole yeah. thing and just see how logical or how offended they get. I think I think mm-hmm. it could uh, save a lot of lives, boys. Could Steve, you're going lives. to could save a lot of lives. Steve's tomorrow is going to be asking his wife this. I'm going to get a text with all the answers and be like, <laughs> she totally failed as well or oh, whatever. I'm, yeah, I'm using this. Yeah. So I'm going to use it on the kids. I'm going to use it on the wife. I'm going to, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a great yeah. question. So obviously, like I know your wife uh, was an actress and stuff as well. Uh, yeah. That's how you guys met, uh, as far as I know. Um, yeah, that's but, our story, uh, and we're sticking to it. Yeah, yeah that's the story. Yeah, that's what I heard many years ago. So, um, yeah, yeah. so what was her reaction like? So I know with with my fiance, uh, our no. first date uh, a few years ago. Uh, I met her at a show. I brought her up on stage and, and performed for her and then ended up chatting with her after and stuff. And two yeah. days later, we went on our first date and she said, the first thing she said to me was, I don't want to know how anything is done. And that was, yeah. after that, I was like, okay, we can be together. Uh, so does your wife right. know how, because I mean, you're constantly working on stuff. Does she so, know how everything is done? Yeah, so here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. When we met, I, I, I always had this thing about never pushing magic, but she loves it. She loves magic. She loves the magic castle. Um, and I don't do it that often. Uh, so uh, she was, and I think I talk about it in the show that she was hugely responsible for me kind of getting back in magic by encouraging me to do the show, by encouraging me to, to kind of do shows again at the castle. And, and, and there was a lot of encouragement from her, but she's also my partner on Magic on Go. So, mm she's behind the camera when when i shoot uh-huh. and the camera moves uh, sometimes i'll just shoot it's just me, me to the camera but sometimes when we need to come in for close-ups and we and the camera starts rocking a bit and it's behind the camera and so she knows way more than she should <laughs> but what's fascinating is that she has this uh rather than being uh, uh blase to it she understands the skill and the dedication and the detail that can go into a magic trick you know, when I start talking about the history of it, I start talking about the variations of it and what it takes to learn. Because I, I have to learn these tricks to perform them for camera. I can't, I'm not just going to be like, the effect is this, here's how it works. I'm going to do it and then I'm going to teach it. And so she'll be there while I'm screwing it up and trying to get it right so that I can, and then in doing that, I'm learning, oh, but what if I do this? And then literally as we're filming, this thing evolves and she sees it grow from one thing to another. Mm-hmm. So her... Uh, I'd say I'd say Ina has one of the greatest attitudes towards magic uh, and then uh, of any non-magician that, that I know. She really appreciates the the mm-hmm. skill level. She's always trying to pick me out to do shows for people, and I'm like, I don't want to do a neighborhood party. Thank you. You know, she's all, she's like, come on. She wants to show me. Up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's what my. Yeah, I, it's a rare. It's a rare thing. I know it's a rare mm-hmm. thing. 
yeah, my fiance loves it. Like if we go to a dinner party or something, because people will start asking me what I do for a living and stuff. And yeah. she's like, I don't have to talk. Like I just sit there. And as soon as you say what you do, everybody just is geared to you. And I can yeah. just enjoy my dinner, you know, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> like there's no pressure to entertain everybody or like be the right. person talking all the time and stuff. So yeah, she loves I mean, it. I love, like, yeah, I, I got it. I love doing shows, but sometimes when you're, you got that one trick that you're probably going to have to do at some point. Yeah. It just kind of burns a hole in your pocket until you get over and done yeah. with it. It's just not, yeah. I don't know. There's something, it's a weird thing. It's just a weird, it's like, it's out of context. It's, uh, I, you know, Eugene Berger was used to like only do magic for people who requested it, which was always such a brilliant thing. You know, when he was yeah. doing the restaurant, I was remember reading about that. This And what a luxury that would be to be able to put the tent cards out and say, if you want to see the magician, let your waiter know. And as opposed yeah. to, as you know, go, hello, can I interrupt your lasagna? Is that an elephant? Yeah. All right, come over here. Here we go. We do some magic for you. Um, that That's, uh, you know, Eugene had the right approach to it, I think. Mm. Yeah, that is always, I guess, the weird part with uh, I've never... with restaurant magic is is the the fact that you're interrupting these people or, or I mean any kind of strolling setting, you know, if it's like a corporate event or dinner or whatever, where you, you have to, yeah. you, you have to, break the ice and and you know and uh and get in the middle of whatever they're doing in a way that isn't offensive and you know especially if if uh you know a couple are on a date or something you know not making yeah. it feel as though you're trying to steal away the attention from the guy you know just like oh you know, yeah do, that's a big one right? delicate couple, way yeah, yeah we go to the table i, all, I always perform for the guy first i always perform for the guy first because i'm not trying yeah. to have him think that i'm trying to just go straight for the girl you know yeah right but then they think you're trying to make them look stupid and they'll find you later. yeah yeah it's a it's a it's a, like it's a 17. <laughs> i was like they, nah, I, yeah i want to go <laughs> so <laughs> i feel i feel like i talk I, I talk about it in the one man show on point it was i think there was part of the monologue where i'm saying like one of you train and you practice and you rehearse and you perfect and you can't wait to perform and then you end up doing these jobs where no one came to see you no one cares yeah. that you're there no yeah. one gives a shit about the card because yeah. quite often can i show you some magic no go away right and you get treated that way and that's demoralizing um but there are people out there who are so socially uh uh magnanimous that they're able to walk into i've met guy you know we all know people who can walk into a situation and just everyone in the room loves them and they they walk up to anyone and they don't care and everyone loves them by the end of the night um that was never me it was i was always always a struggle in the in the strolling for me mm. Uh, even when I had a gig, I had to, uh, when it was like a professional gig and walk around, I had to really work hard on my, how I would approach people and, uh, mm. uh, you know, and yeah. deal with, uh, the, the, the jerks of the, of the party. But it was, yeah. uh, yeah, that was, uh, it's a very interesting thing. I guess one of the few things, well, I guess in musicians, you have it, if you have a band is playing and everyone's talking and, and drinking, you know, and this person went to Juilliard, but here they are in a bar. Uh, you know, playing the uh, the piano. It's, uh, we all have those those things that we have to deal with. Yeah. yeah. Now, here's a question that kind of goes off of that is, uh, I remember talking to you years ago about, and I think you talk about it in your show as well, is like you breaking into acting in LA when people knew yeah. you as the guy that does magic, right? Is like, you become so good at magic yeah. that, you know, you're in, invited to all these parties, but to do magic, right? And you want to be an yeah. actor. Um, so what was yeah. that like for you? Because obviously, I mean, obviously you were able to break down that wall and the barrier because we've seen you on was, everything. Yeah. You abandoned <laughs> us for a little while. <laughs> I think a little while. I got, out, I got the hell out of there. Uh, you know, it was, um, it was a very difficult time because in England, I, th I feel like at the time in England, you could do variety and you could do a television show, you could do theatre and uh the arts were appreciated uh, uh they mixed a lot um and what i discovered when i got to the states was uh that I, I, maybe less now maybe a little bit less now because you're expected to be to do a million things but uh certainly uh back then um yeah i i i i was appearing at the castle all the time and then i would do all these beverly hills house parties they're brilliant parties like massive mansions lots of lots of money very successful people and then I would go to an audition and one of them would be there and they'd be like, oh, you did my kids' bar mitzvah, what are you doing here? 
you know, and you're like, well, I'm here to read for the role. And they're like, yeah, if a role comes up from the I'll let you know. And you start to realize that there is this pigeonholing that goes on. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, it could just could be that I sucked, but that's another, but that doesn't make for a good story. So uh, I think it's pigeonholing. And um, the, there came a point, uh, I was, uh, I talk about it in the show, but I was having, I was invited, I met this guy, Ray Stark, who was a big Hollywood producer at the Magic Castle. He saw me in the close up room and he said, uh, I want you to come. And in my introduction, I, I was like, I always make sure to say like he's an actor. You've seen him guest starring. I was already guest starring on a few bits of things, and uh, he said, "I want you to come for dinner on Saturday. Uh, you don't have to perform. Or anything. Just come. I want to talk to you about a movie." And um, and I thought this is great. This is this is, this is, this is exciting. So I go to this his house, and he lived in the old Rock Hudson's old mansion. So there was I remember driving in, and there was a police car at the very front uh, of the. Uh, of the driveway and I, and I when i got there i was like is everything okay he goes oh yeah i just i own the car i just park it there to keep people away and so we go into this it was a weird kind of it was a weird hollywood night a lot of strange people dinner um and, uh, and then we all had to watch a movie when it was american pie but and he was the it was the old school way where they send the movie over from the studio in the it's still in the reel right because they got projectors yeah. in his projector room so he watched american pie which was very interesting because he didn't quite understand what was going on with the pie scene. uh and <laughs> at the end everyone leaves and it's just uh it's just us uh uh and him and he hands me a script and it's um it's uh uh, uh houdini he's going to remake houdini and he was talking about tom cruise playing houdini i don't know if ever that was solidified i don't know but I remember having this script in my hands and he was talking about Tom because Tom loves magic and how great he'd be for Houdini. And I was like, what role can I play? And he was like, you can help me just put the magic together. You know, just do the, and I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll do that for free. But can I get, you know, I don't know, five lines. Can I be the bartender? Can I do something that helps me break, break in, you know? And he said to me, it was like, you, you, he says, I saw you at the castle. What you've got to decide what you are. You have to decide if you're going to be, yeah, you know, what are you? You're a magician, you're an actor, you gotta choose, you know? And he would give me a part. And uh, so I remember I went home that night and uh, and that's that was kind of when it was, I was like, oh, I'm, pretty done. I'm pretty done here. And then, yeah, and I had one big bad magic show, which I talk about in, in, my, in my show with a bunch of celebrities and talk about failing uh, if we your heroes. And then, um, I was just like, okay, I'm done. And I, I got rid of all my magic and I um, uh, started, I got my first series like a year later. I just felt like I needed to just get rid of it and focus 100% on, on the acting. It was, and it was really scary because I was making a lot of money doing these private parties, this circuit. And um, I got booked in Vegas. And I remember I was working at the, uh, the Riviera and the guy that was the entertainment director called me and uh, he said, I want to I wanna put a show around you and put you in one of the smaller hotels. I like what you're doing. And I was like, uh, what hotel? And he goes, what the fuck does it matter what hotel? We're going to put you in one of the fucking hotels. We'll get some girls. We'll put them around you. And, you know, you know, and I was like, and I had to make that decision again right there. Like, do I want to spend the rest of my life in Las Vegas? You know, maybe not. It may have failed, but it was because like, oh, if I'm in Vegas, there's no way I'm going to be able to audition in L.A. Uh, yeah. And that was again one of those decisions where I'm like, no, I've got to turn down this potential Vegas show because I need to be in LA for the auditions. It was always just like this mm-hmm. quiet kind of like I need to do this. And then uh, uh, this I remember this guy I was in an acting class, and this guy came up to me and he goes, he said to me, he said, "Do you really think you're going to get work?" And I was like, "Yeah, I, I believe in myself. I think some someday something will happen." And he goes, oh, I don't know. He says, look at me. He goes, I'm short, I'm fat, I'm Jewish. I play doctors, I play lawyers, I play all this stuff. He goes, you're tall, you're skinny, you got a massive forehead. He says, I, I just, what roles are you going to play? You know, <laughs> got to be realistic, you know. And I was like, I'll play this. I was like, I'll, play, I'll probably end up playing the Steve Valentine role, you know, something that will be uh, a little bit weird out there. But, you know, I remember Jack Nicholson, like he could never, he couldn't get arrested. You know, he ended up becoming his own type. So I was like, I, I just was like, that's, not a very nice thing to say, but uh, I am uh, one day you know, something will happen. And years later, uh, he ended up guest starring on Crossing Jordan, which was my second series. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it was that moment where you just kind of like, welcome to the show. It's great to have mm-hmm. you here. I'll be in my trailer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Did he just drop? That was the perfect way to drop out of a call. 
Yeah, what just, just happened? <laughs> that was spectacular. Gone. He just winked and literally Gone. disappeared. Gone. I'll be in my trailer. <laughs> Maybe he did. I wonder if he did it on purpose to be like, and boom. That was. Is crazy. that his way of being like, I'm I'm done with the done. well. Well, I guess in the meantime, we have a giveaway to attend to uh, yeah. of our own. Um, everybody that hasn't checked out stevevalentine.com slash magic, make sure that you go check out Steve Valentine's website Definitely. and learn some of his magic. Um, oh, he just dropped in. Uh, that What finesse, what style. Uh, it was crazy. That was, <laughs> that was insane. That was you literally, you, you, you said, I'll be in my trailer. You winked and instantly vanished from the whole show. <laughs> that was, I'm like, what the fuck? That was perfect. Oh, okay. Yeah, you I, could you have, know script, I you have scripted back. it better. <laughs> he shouldn't have come back. He just should have left it. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was insane. Like, you, you ruined it, Steve. You came back. That was just the enough. most stylish exit. <laughs> <laughs> just, I think, that was yeah. great. Oh my god! Wow! Well, yeah. oh, just edit it when you get to edit this. If you ever edit any of these, just edit this piece out that we're doing right now. That's the, no, no, that's that. Yeah, that one hundred percent is going to be the new like trailer for the show. Yeah, it's like you at the end. Trailer. I'll be in my trailer. I'll be in my trailer. <laughs> wow! Yeah, the comments are freaking out. They're like, "Oh my gosh, that was good." Uh, wow. yeah. Well, okay, I, okay, then I totally, uh, uh, you know, that was planned. <laughs> that was planned. That was yeah. That was a <laughs> planned exit. Totally. No, that was that was really spectacular. So, you you felt as though you needed to to kind of totally go down that that lane. Now, were you yeah. doing any any performing at all during that time? I mean, I, I'm assuming that you didn't lose your your if you're the kind of person that is researching all of this magic material and diving so deep into the past i'm sure that that passion was still there but were you no, just keeping it to yourself uh, or not no, at all no i i was cold wow. turkey for quite a long wow. time and I, I i didn't become this person until i got back into it mm. and that was the that was the i didn't uh um this, this whole new approach to magic uh, came after working as a magician for a long time. It was, so you're, you're just, saying yeah. there's still a hope for the rest of us. Then. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, 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 there's hope for all of us. You could leave for 10 years, come yeah. back and crush come back yeah. And be, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, what, was it, what was it like going from, you know, magic you see many performers are very kind of self-contained. You know, you see them trying to, you know, direct their own shows. And, you know, yeah. it, for you, when with magic, you're kind of on your own. You know, you, you write your own script, you perform your own show, you make it entirely, you know, you in the performance. And you can, you know, go out and just, you know, get a gig and, you know, you can perform anywhere. And then going from that to where you you have writers, you're saying somebody else's lines, you have directors telling you what to do, you have producers that they're beholden to. There's yeah. you know the the fact that you have agents and managers and everything. What was that like? That transition going into that whole different uh, world. It was awesome. I loved it. <laughs> it was awesome <laughs> because it's there's there's um uh uh there's a freedom to being a magician and to being your own person, your own variety artist. Um, but when you're part of a larger machine and uh, it is, uh, and the product and you're producing this kind of really cool product, I don't know, there was something about it that was, uh, I just, uh, maybe it was, it was in some ways taking the pressure off me to, to, you know, and, but also just really, it's where I always wanted to be. So every time I drove onto the lot at Universal, I would drive in and I'd get in my parking space and I would just sit for a minute, you know, I'm like, this is, I'm really gonna soak this up just cause mm. parking space, got my trailer, get the hair and makeup, go do my work. And uh, uh, it just, there was something about, it was an incredibly magical time. The very first time that that, that kind of all came together. It was mm. uh, because Crossing Jordan came. I'm going to lower my voice right now because it's getting late and I've got neighbors. Mm. Uh, but uh, uh, Crossing Jordan came about because I did a guest spot on a pilot. Mm. And um, when the pilot got picked up, uh, they brought me back for another spot. And it went really well. And they brought back a third episode and a fourth episode. And then by the fifth episode, they were like, this really works. Let's make him part of the show. And it kind of, it kind of organically grew. So I kind of mm. earned the role. Um, in the work that I was doing in the first bunch of episodes, which made it more, even more kind of special. Awesome. You know, so I remember this one day just showing up for the sixth episode and, uh, and 
and everyone welcoming me as the, like, the series regular, you know? And it was, it was a very special time because we would get at lunchtime, I would go, um, I'd get a golf cart and I'd go up to the psycho house, you know, and we'd sit by the psycho house and watch the tram go by and just eat a sandwich and wave at people. It was, that was a great time. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And so you're good. right that, that that kind of collaborative energy of being part of something and, and you know that that energy on a set is uh is just electric and it's it's not you know yeah and, and you're not all alone i mean like i remember we were talking about my show at the you know at the montalban or whatever it's like people don't yeah. realize it's like after the audience leaves then it's just you packing up for hours <laughs> just it's really all alone sad. in this dark theater it's very sad yeah. yeah 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 the glamour the true glamour of show business not really yeah. uh yeah so it was yeah that was that was pretty great I have to say, and mm -hmm. and I wouldn't do magic, and uh, at the time I, I refused to do it. And there even there was a producer, one of the network executives who had seen me at a party like three or four years earlier. Uh, he came up to me and goes, "You you uh, you did uh, magic at um, Avi Lerner's uh, a holiday party, right?" Yeah, and I was like, "Nah, it wasn't me." And he goes, "Yeah, yeah, it was you." And I'm like, "Nah, no, it wasn't me." And he comes in the next day and he's got my old business card. You know, he's got this <laughs> Steve Valentine sparkling hocus pocus, bright yellow English flags in the corner. And, uh, and he, goes, uh, he goes, yeah, this is the card. And I'm like, nah, that's another Steve Valentine. Looks like me, sounds like me, it's not me. I just refuse to, awesome. I refuse to do it. And they-, they Like it's a, it's di it, like literally a different person. Like you just totally dissociated from that yeah. life. Yeah, yeah, wow. completely, Crazy. yeah. Crazy. But then it was, I was doing a movie in New Zealand and it was, while I was doing that movie that that things happened that brought me back into magic. So it just, I think you can, uh, I think the universe has a way sometimes of, uh, no matter what you want to do, it doesn't really matter. You know, you know there's that saying yeah. that God laughs at plans of men, right? Um, I think that's, uh, uh, I think that's a very, you know, if you're meant to do something or if, if there's a reason for you to do something, then the universe is going to bring you back to it, no matter how hard you try and get away from it. And that's kind of, I'm in shooting a movie in New Zealand and I bump into a guy that I knew when I was a kid who was a magician. And it's like, how does that happen? And he's got video of back in the old days of the magic club and my old wow. mentor and just, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, that was, that was very special too. Sometimes you've got to listen to the world and, um, and then just, yeah. And then it just kind of, kind of came back full force after that. It was very strange. Mm. And now do you feel that, do you, do you feel that right now the balance that you have is is kind of the you know the optimal like perfect balance of being able to to be in both worlds and surfing it and that you don't have to you don't have to abandon one in order to be in the other yeah i think that i think i came to the conclusion that uh, uh that we should all just do what we want to do and uh, sod it if other people don't like it and that's kind of where i'm at right now so it's uh, if i want to do a stage show i'll do a stage show if i want to do a magic show i'll do a magic show i toured with the illusionist a couple of years ago because it was something i really wanted to do uh and i don't really find every now and then i still get the old twinge you know if a uh, if a casting director will call and go, we thought about you because it's the part of a magician. I'm like, mm. it just okay, all right. <laughs> uh, it just that 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 kind of still comes back to me a little bit. But but yeah uh, yeah, yeah it's got. A, I think there's nothing wrong with being a polymath. I think that it's it makes life more fun, and uh, and we all do a bunch of things, and we should be proud of it. Yeah. So is there a role, like uh, other than Crossing Jordan, because I know yeah. you mentioned that, that was like your favorite role that you've ever played uh, and then vice versa. Is there a show that you were so excited to do that you were like, oh, this is going to be amazing. And then you got there and you're like, this is terrible. I just want to get out of here. So many of those. Uh, yeah, many of those. I think um, uh, for me, uh, I did an episode of, I mean, The Walk was an amazing movie and I was in incredible company and that was a really special experience, but also one of the most insecure experiences of my career because uh, the whole time I'm there, I'm, I'm in the middle of, with, I'm, I'm with like Academy Award winners and I'm just like, don't be the person who sucks. Don't yeah. be the one who sucks <laughs> in this film. And Zemeckis had fought for me because I'd auditioned for it. And the studio had said, well, we think we can get like a really big name just to do a cameo. And he's like, no, I want Steve. So he fought me. And, and uh, that meant at that point, I was like, I don't even care if I get the part. When I heard that, I was like, that's just, that's just really special. Um, so I was like, don't let him down. So I, I can't say I totally enjoyed that because I was just so focused on uh, uh, trying to survive and, uh, and do the best I could. 
Uh, but the, the show that I had the best time was uh, an episode of Psyched. We did the 100th episode and I played a, another rock star, which I have a tendency to play rock stars. And um, uh, it was the entire cast except for Tim Curry from the movie Clue, right? So it was, uh, it was uh, Christopher Lloyd and it was, wow. it was, it was unbelievable. Wow. Martin Mull was amazing. And it was a, it was a, a kind of a send up of Clue, but done with the psych cast and all these other people. And I'm like in the room, so I'm hanging out with Chris Lloyd, you know, and we're like walking down the street and I'm like, this is Chris Lloyd, this is Chris Lloyd. This, he's so, he's so cool. And the, the guys who ran that show, Psych, um, they're just like, you know, just come and try and, you know, a lot of people when you do a show will be, uh, you know, if that guy's funnier than me, I don't want him on camera. Whereas these guys are like, bring it, bring everything you got. We'll try and top it. We don't care if you're the funniest thing in the scene. That's great. It works. They're so generous. That it's, it's rare. And that's why the show was so good. Um, yeah. so, so I had a freedom to kind of be what I wanted to be in it. But I, I, one uh, final story is I, I was, uh, we were shooting, Van, was it here or Vancouver? Vancouver. And we went out to a casino to shoot. And, and uh, Chris and I are gonna go in and get a drink at the bar. Chris, listen to me, yeah, Chris, you know, hey, Chris, my buddy, Chris, yeah. My buddy, my pal. And uh, we were going to get an, at the casino and there's a bouncer and this is the power of hollywood man and there's the bouncer and he's like that just like standing there like this and he looks at me and he looks at chris and he's like id so we, and he just kind of flashed the id and he's like all right you go so we go so chris goes first and then i turn to the bouncer and i'm like you know who that is right and he goes what I'm like that's doc brown man and i saw this guy this like six or seven huge huge guy he looked he turned around he looked at the guy and he goes <laughs> Can I get his autograph? And I was like, come with me, you know. Come with me. It was watching this man, this tough yes. guy, just melt into like what an eight-year-old child when he first saw Back mm. to the Future. And it was yeah. the most beautiful experience. It was so That's great amazing. to see. Yeah. I'll never wow. forget that. That was the power of uh, of uh, mm. film and television. You know? Yeah. And just as you felt pigeonholed into the magic role, I'm sure that he's getting great Scott for the rest of his life. Yeah. The rest yeah. of his life. And he's really owned it now, though, if you look at, I mean, he just did a thing uh, where they were searching for DeLorean. So he's, uh, nah. he's, uh, yeah. Actually, I he's just right. seen him in a movie. What movie was it? Like a couple of days ago. And, was it the uh, Seth MacFarlane one where he uh, he has a little cameo? No, oh, this did he? one, he, he plays a, a father of, uh, who was it? he's like an ex uh they call him the accountant he's the ex accountant for like the cia and everything so his job is to go and basically murder people essentially uh, but oh, he's right. trying to live like just a family life uh and doc plays his his dad uh oh and, uh yeah that ben um, affleck right uh, no it's not it's not, it's not the accountant it's not ben affleck but it um but it, okay. it reminded me of that because they call themselves, they're both called accountants, but. Uh, right, 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 right. But, yeah. Oh, shoot. I forget what it was called, but I, I think it was on Amazon or something. And I, I said to Anya, I was like, do you know who that is? And she's like, no. And I'm like, back to the future. I'm like, it's Doc. Yeah. I was like, it's a shit. And it took her a second to see him again. So crazy. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, yeah. That's, that, yeah, he's amazing. And Zemeckis would tell us uh, uh, great stories when we were on set about making that movie. And, you know, all the, he's like, you can ask me anything as we're making the film. So I'm like, great. We've got Robert Zemeckis there. So we got stories on everything. It was uh, a lot of which I can't repeat, but it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I'm actually going to have to go because we're in a, a, a place where my neighbors are sleeping and I'm, I don't want to uh, no uh, annoy no, we've them. We've been going quite a while. No worries. Yeah. This has been, been such a, a fascinating pleasure, conversation. I, I enjoyed this thoroughly. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Thank you so much, Steve, for coming on. Uh, always a pleasure. Uh, hopefully we'll see you Thanks. soon. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you'll come down. We'll, do we'll, we'll get some coffee, mate, when this whole thing lifts up. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. A hundred percent. All right, I'll look forward to it. And Blaze, I'll see you uh, at some point. Some point, yes. We'd love to. Yeah. We'd love to get together whenever we're in the same place. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta leave on the same note that you left us last time, Steve. Uh, All right, ready? Uh, yeah. So anyway, um, I'll be in my trailer.
And he's out. And he's out. <laughs> we got, I needed to make sure we dropped him. All right. Thank you so much again to Steve Valentine for being here. Um, that was a fun episode. That was a fun episode. Thank you guys, everybody that tuned in for the whole we're on for over two and a half hours. So yeah, this has been amazing. Uh, yeah, and we have sticking around. scrolling down there. Uh, if anybody hasn't yet, make sure you go to stevevalentine.com slash magic, get your free magic and check out his website. This, yeah, he right. just posted his 600th <laughs> tutorial. <laughs> yeah. And he goes, I'm being modest. I, my computer says 701 or something like, so yeah so if you Absolutely. if you need a one-stop shop magic resource for pretty much anything you can think of then uh then yeah definitely check out stevevalentine.com slash magic and definitely. uh let's also uh give a a quick shout out to a few more things we have the the magic discord uh if you would like to yeah. join a magic community online where you can meet many other magicians you can hang out where you can uh, yeah. It's not down there. Yeah, yeah. Let's throw it up yeah. right here. We got join the Magic Discord. Go to one v one magic dot com, and uh, I'll also throw up our uh, thing right here. We got our, our nice little overlay. I'll just uh, let, me, let me hide that. So you can join us. You can see it right there. Uh, join us yeah. at one v one magic dot com. If you go to that website, you'll be able to hang out with a bunch of other magicians. You can meet. You don't have to be a magician. You can be someone that just enjoys magic hang out and uh, and get to jam and uh, collaborate with other magicians. That's where I've been able to meet a lot of other members of the community. I'm on there all the time. Ryan hops in every so often and uh, we jam every Thursday. So uh, so jump in and join us. And uh, now let's get to our, our giveaway. Our giveaway, yeah. And then we get to announce who's on next week. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We've got another crazy episode coming at you next week with a yes. special date. Special date next week. Special date. So. Special date. Oh yes, because of yeah, dates yeah. change. I yeah. thought you meant like, uh, it, like I'm gonna take you out on a date. <laughs> I'm going to. You're way too tired. <laughs> no, I'm gonna. Well, I'm gonna be there with the guest. I think you will be. So there I, I think that you know, I, I'll be taking the guest out on a date. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Blaine will be on a special date next I'll week with our guest. Uh, with our guest, Mister. Well, should we say it? Uh, well, let's do our let's give our do our giveaway. Let's do giveaway. Let's yeah. do the giveaway first. Uh, so we have to have a question for the giveaway. We we're always bad at this part of the the episode, right? Mm. Like we never have a question prepared. Yeah, I think um, that. Well, it's a uh, you know it's good to base it off of the, the okay. The I think I've got a good question. All right. Okay. So uh, earlier in the episode, Steve was talking about how after a lot of his research he was inspired to potentially, instead of doing a signed card to pocket, to do a signed Good something question. else to pocket. Good question. What was it that Steve was inspired to have appear in his pocket? A signed something. And Oh, look at that. O2 right Whitey. away. O2. O2 Whitey got it. Egg. Ooh. Signed egg to pocket. That is fantastic. You are absolutely correct. So you win any download on lostartmagic.com. So make sure to hit me up on mentalism.ca. Send me an email or not an email. Send me an, a message on there. Uh, and I will make sure that you uh, that you get whatever download you want. Absolutely. Congratulations. That was the fastest we've ever had somebody that was immediately yeah. get the answer. And that was from like an hour and a half ago. So thank you so much for sticking around with us and watching for so long. Uh, this was such a fascinating conversation. I really enjoyed having yeah, Steve. Yeah, me too. I, Steve had so many things that like, you know, hit the nail on the head. Uh, if people were watching and I like, you know, I've got paper here. I mean, we can go back and watch the episode. I always love like, I know a couple of weeks ago, you were taking notes on stuff. Because, I mean, as much as we are friends with these guys and we're chatting with them, like Steve is just a wealth of knowledge as well. Like his uh, like his experience level, like trumps all of us mm -hmm. um, and, and like what he's done and been able to do in his career and, and the things that he's seen and, and stuff and been involved with is insane. So, uh, you know, there were so many gold nuggets in this episode that if you watch it back, like make sure to copy down notes because Steve said some things tonight that uh, mm. that if magicians took to heart would just make them even better. 
Oh, so. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's somebody that really had, I mean, any, anything that he said, he, he is coming from, you know, decades of experience and, uh, yeah. and just like, and also I don't, it's a, it's a similar thing. If what I asked you, it's like, I can't imagine that he sleeps with the amount of research that he's doing and the amount of content oh, yeah. that he's putting out and performing and doing acting gigs. Like the man is crazy busy, but, uh, but is giving back so much to the community. So yeah, it's a, it's really amazing. That's a, that's a thing too. Like Steve took off 10 years, this kibosh magic done comes back into magic and is destroying it. Like, yeah. you know, guys putting out 600 videos on. Well, that's, that's why I asked that. Cause I was like, you've got to be like, you must've been practicing in the background. He's like, no cold yeah. Turkey. I gave it up like an addiction. Like what? Oh yeah. Yeah. I remember hearing those stories before talking to him and him being like, yeah, absolutely not nothing because he wanted to be an actor which which is awesome as well because it, it kind of like if you want to make it as a professional magician or mentalist or performer like steve just totally forgot about this whole past that he had and said i'm going to focus on this so much now, i'm not saying you know steve is very lucky and he was able to do it and stuff i i would never tell anybody to like drop their day job and focus on something like obviously make sure you're financially stable don't put yourself out of house and home or food or clothes on your back. I think that's important. And I think that that also teaches you work ethic and stuff to be able to, to focus on something when, after you're done your day job. But um, once you can make it, then quit your day job. That's fine. Once, once you have that income, but he focused on something so hard and then uh, you know, obviously he was successful in acting, but then when he came back to magic, focused in so hard on things like card to pocket like yeah. to bring out a seven dvd set on one trick is yeah. that's the first time that's ever been done i'm yeah. sure i will put unheard of I, I can't think of anybody who's come close to that no like there's so much knowledge on that to the point where it's like like to sit like steve knows most likely that he's the only one doing that that card to pocket, you know, like because yeah. of the amount of research that he's done and stuff, no one is emulating that because it's just so ridiculous. I know like I've seen his routine quite a few times and yeah, it's nuts. Like there's yeah. cards coming from every pocket and back and forth and stuff. So yeah. And, um, and yeah, it, it's just, uh, it's incredible. And you think about nowadays, a lot of uh, magic companies, you know, they, they want to keep their their tutorial products it, it, with, you know, I, when I've put out products, you know, I have the company telling me like, Oh no, we need to cut this down. You know? And I'm like, I can't do it. I can't explain this in less than 90 minutes. And they're like, Oh, we were hoping you could keep the whole tutorial to less than 45 minutes. You know, and it's yeah. like, that's what they're looking for. And Steve is on the opposite end of the spectrum going, I'm going to give you the most in-depth tutorial that you can possibly get a masterclass in whatever I'm teaching you and give you all of the information and he's really contributing so much to future generations, hundreds of hours. He's not limiting himself and going, oh, I need to teach this trick. Just, you know, they can do it in 30 minutes. He's going, I'm yeah. going to give you hundreds of hours of content that I put years of work into. It's really yeah, that's inspiring. The, that's the crazy thing is just like how much he's giving back. And like, I know, like I, like I said, I met Steve almost 10 years. I see, he said about eight years ago at Magic Camp. And he didn't know me from a hole in the wall. He, he knew like I made card clips and stuff. Uh, and we ended up chatting and became friends with his wife as well. And we're all friends on Facebook and chat and stuff. And, you know, and then when, when he moved back to Toronto, I hit him up and, and he's like, let's grab coffee and stuff sometime. Obviously we're on lockdown, so we can't, but, um, but, you know, genuinely just a nice, every, nice guy. Every time I've run into Steve, he takes that time to, to talk to you. And, and I feel like, we need more people like Steve in the magic community that are just yeah. willing to pass on that information to the next generation. Yeah. So that's why, I mean, that's why this show started was so that we could bring on these guys and hopefully people in the magic community and outside the magic community would learn things about magic mm -hmm. um, and, and hopefully make every performer out there, no matter if it's magic or whatever you're doing better. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. And a testament to what you were talking about with the fact that he takes time regardless of who you are. When I was, I think, you know, uh, 16, maybe 15 uh, in Connecticut, he, he came to a, a convention, was performing and lecturing at a convention that was, uh, you know, um, it was in Cape Cod in Massachusetts. And yeah. so I went to the convention and then I was trying to pursue acting and magic simultaneously. And 
I, you know, I asked him about his advice for that. And, and he was, you know, the, one of the first people to tell me, he was saying, you know, if you want to, if you want to be able to be cast in things, he was like, you've got to be in LA, you've got to be there, you know, it, yeah. regardless of, you know, um, regardless of anything, if you want to even be in something that shoots in New York, they cast out of LA. He was like, you can't be trying to apply for stuff and then they've got to fly you out, you know, for you to audition. You've got to just be there. And yeah. then the opportunity will be much more available to you. And, you know, he said it, you know, so seriously that, uh, and the fact that he took, uh, you know, a lot of time to give me a, quite a bit of advice as somebody that, you know, like he didn't need to do that at all. I was just some random kid, you know, but the fact that he, he did that, and then I did move to LA and it, a lot of it, you know, came down because of that advice. And then yeah. I ended up, I guess, in a doing kind of the opposite of, you know, <laughs> what he did where after going to LA, didn't pursue any acting at all, just yeah. kind of went straight down the magic path. And I'd love to return to that at some point, but um, sure. it, because of that being in the location and because of really just like, you know, laser focusing on it, you know, has have been able to, you know, make it a, a career. And uh, yeah. it's similar to what, what we were talking about with, uh, with Nick last week about how, you know, he was put in a situation where it was, it was, you know, it was, you know, everything's on the line, you know, and I've got to do this path. I've got to make it work, you know, or else, you know, or, or else it's like, I'm failing. I'm moving back in with my parents and trying to find a job, you know, and, mm -hmm. and because of that and being in that situation and laser focusing, he was able to make it work. And the thing with exactly. Steve of him saying, you know, I'm going to, totally put magic on the back burner and not touch it at all and yeah. the thing that he it was his career that he was super passionate about and saying no i want to to do acting it's really it's really incredible really inspiring that you're doing that yeah definitely no i mean yeah i mean we could learn so much from him and and you know uh, just uh, it's bewildering how much knowledge that guy has and how genuinely down to earth he is uh, and, you know, like you said, just took the time to talk to you and probably was a huge influence or at least a part of an influence on you, you know, picking up and just moving to LA, you know, mm -hmm. right after school and saying, Definitely well, a big influence. I'm going to make this a, make this a run. Right. And even though you didn't do acting, I mean, you're still killing it in the magic community and creating things that are stupid. <laughs> you know, uh, when I say stupid, I, again, I mean in the best way possible uh, because I can't do it. Uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, but it, it was certainly a huge influence. He, well, and thank you for saying that, but yeah, it was, it was certainly a huge influence, you know, and, and the fact that he was, you know, he gave the, the advice kind of very straight up, you know, of, you know, if you really want this, then, you know, you, you've got to be there. And, he, and it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't some kind of generic advice of like, Oh, you know, just follow your heart, follow your dreams. You know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was yeah, like, exactly. no, you've got to work hard and you've got to, you know, put yourself out there and you've got to be there so that if there's any opportunity that could arise, you're, you're ready to snatch up that opportunity and, and, you know, go head first into it, you know? Yeah, and, 100%, uh, and, 100%. yeah. And it seems like that, you know, and the thing is it, all of the advice that he gave throughout this talk and any piece of advice that I've ever heard him, you know, give, he, he's, it's not just conjecture. It's like, he's lived it yeah. and it's through no, real experience. And that's, what's so amazing about, you know, about what he's talked about. It's not just theory. It's, it's, you know, he has, he's living proof of it. Yeah. It was funny to hear him say like how, like kind of awestruck, like, you know, celebrity, like doc, you know, from back to the future was to him where now in the magic community, like Steve would be that to younger guys and stuff, yeah. right? Like, you know, when I remember meeting Steve for the first time, I was like, oh, you're, you know, you're Steve Valentine. Like, this is crazy. And then I was like, whoa, you're also in all of these things. Like, you're a crazy yeah. actor as well, you know? Um, so yeah. it's interesting to hear him say, like, how he still has those moments in his life, even though, like, he's done so much compared to most mm. people. But yeah. uh, but I feel like a, a lot of people, at least in the magic community, well, I mean, not even in the magic community, in life in general, if they saw Steve would be like, hey, you're the guy, you know, because um, yeah. I messaged him a few weeks ago, I was watching a TV show and then all of a sudden Steve walks on the screen. I think I took a photo of it and it's like, hey, I'm watching you right now. <laughs> Just take you know, a selfie like, with Steve. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh man, this is crazy. So he shows up in random places. <laughs> so. Yeah. But, uh, well, should Somehow we tell them who we have on next week? Yes. Yeah, we got a we have drum roll. We really got it drum rolling. Uh, 
we are so excited to announce that next week on Magic After Dark, we have Mr. Colin Cloud. <laughs> we were so out of sync. It was Colin, Colin, Cloud, Cloud. Cloud, Cloud, Cloud. But yes, we're so excited to have him on. And I will be yeah, in Vegas. So, I mean, maybe I'll be in a in a hotel room <laughs> with <Yeah>. X <laughs> doing, yeah, exactly. doing, the, doing it. Or uh, I think what's most likely is we'll probably just be in the same spot. And uh, Yeah. And yeah. it's also on Thursday night next week, not yeah. Wednesday. So Thursday night, yes. 10 p.m. My date with Colin is on another <laughs> date. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You have a date with Colin on a different date, on Thursday, date. 10 yes. p.m. next week, ladies and gentlemen. Make sure. I was looking at my mic there for a second. Uh, pointing at the mic instead of at the camera uh which is odd but uh, it's late it's, it's late. just it's just a little minion it's just a little yeah. person that you're, you're talking I, to. you know what though i will say this last week someone commented while we were on the stream that my audio was bad uh and uh and so usually when i do my shows i've got like a lapel headset mic thing and stuff so i watched the youtube uh, video after and i said yeah my sound is not as good as blazes and uh and nicks and so i went out and bought uh, bought this guy so hopefully uh my sound this week is much better it was much better uh, and, it was great and it makes, i want to show you guys we listen to the stuff that you guys tell us listen so if there's the something feedback. you want to see on magic after dark hit us up as but, long as you don't say uh, that we should stop the lasagna stuff. You know, we yeah. listen to all feedback. We're not, yeah. we're not gonna anything mm, other than that. We're, anything that other than that. Crazy. That's not. That's a. <laughs> that's that non-negotiable. That was a crazy thing. We got a whole new genre of lasagna tonight. I I never had considered the shapes. shapes. Triangular. Yeah. Polygonal lasagna yeah. was yeah. spectacular. Yeah. Polygonal. I mean, the creativity of Steve oh, Valentine yeah. is off the charts. Yeah. Just a testament to, <laughs> to his creative energy. That's it. Triangular. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Next level lasagna. Yeah. So it's like when you were triangulating your pergola. That's it. Yeah. That has to get yeah. done. Still. Not done yet. Not done. <laughs> <laughs> much to do. But Too thank you so good. much, everybody, for watching. We've been on for two hours and 45 minutes. This is, But this has been, I mean, it flew by. This was just it such did, a fun episode. I mean, I feel like. If if Steve had started showing us stuff with the card to pocket, we could have been on till next Thursday, and Colm would have then uh, then yeah. just came on. But uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, we love you guys. You guys uh, make this possible. Uh, that's probably yeah. That's like wrapping it up, right? Yeah. Thank you so much for all your support, everybody. Yeah, and we will see you on Thursday. Peace. <laughs>